One of the deepest mysteries of the Christian faith is the triune or Trinitarian nature of God. Uh, and there's something very, very special to be seen in the relationship between God the Son and God the Spirit and the believer. And we're going to talk about that today on Beyond the Notes. I'm Pastor Russell Howard, and I'm really, really glad you're with us today. The, uh, the Trinity is, is a difficult and mysterious concept. It just is. One of the things that is, is said of the Trinity, and, and I believe it's, it's a correct statement, of course it's a correct statement, is that there's the, the fact of the Trinity, that God is, is one personality that expresses himself in three persons, is, is what's called an irreducible fact. It's it's. The universe is central, irreducible fact that the God who is is a triune God. What that means is he, he defies metaphor. You can't say the Trinity is like this or that or the other because there are all kinds of, of heresy you get into very, very quickly when you try to force a mold onto the Trinity. There is one God. We do not worship three gods. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are all God, not in the sense that all three of them are equally God, but in the sense that they are all the same one God. And if that makes your head feel like it's going to, you know, slightly stretch to the point of exploding, you're probably seeing it correctly. It's a, it's an interesting concept. And as we looked at the passage this week on Sunday morning, this back half of John 14, where Jesus promises the coming Holy Spirit. It, it led me to want to peer more deeply into something for a moment that I thought would be a really, really good place to take this week's Beyond the Notes. Let me, let me pose a question. The question is, where is Jesus right now? Where is Jesus right now? You know, Easter is coming up in just a little while, and one of the most important, distinctive truths we, we guard and express, the Bible is clear about it, that the, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a physical resurrection. That the body that went into that grave on Friday came out of that grave on Sunday, albeit glorified, a very different form and a very sort of the eternal glorified version of that body. But, but 1 Corinthians 15, for example, makes it clear that what happened to Jesus on Easter Sunday as he walked out of his grave physically is the basis and the model for the physical resurrection of all believers. This is not a, a spiritual event. What came out of the grave was not some, you know, Jesus the, the ghost. It was Jesus, the man, Jesus Christ. And the, the one that spent those 
those days with his disciples, those 40 days after the resurrection, was the physically embodied man, Jesus Christ. He, he demonstrated some supernatural capabilities. He could travel very, very quickly. Uh, he could literally walk through walls, but he was not a spirit being. He was a physically embodied uh, John 21. He sits on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and eats some fish with the guys. So this is an embodied, physical, resurrected eternally durable body like you and I will one day have in the resurrection. So, and, and that is the Jesus that ascended in Acts chapter one, when he, when he flew up into the clouds at, um, on the side of the Mount of Olives there facing Jerusalem. So we, we must guard the physical resurrection of Jesus and the physical reality of what First Timothy 2, 5 calls our intercessor the man, Jesus Christ. In his present form, he is a man. Well, where, where is he? Well, we don't have to wonder about that. Now, set aside for a moment what you know about the fundamental omnipresence of God. And hang on, because this is an Easter truth that is to be preserved. Hang on to your understanding that Jesus Christ is a resurrected human being at this moment. At this moment, in the spring of 2022, Jesus is a resurrected human being. And Ephesians 1.20, Colossians 3.1, Hebrews 8.1, and Hebrews 12.2 all unite in telling us that, that that resurrected Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father in the throne room of the universe with God the Father. One time, by the way, as a fun footnote, he is depicted as standing beside the throne of God the Father, and that is when he welcomes the first martyr, Stephen the first person aside from Jesus himself to die for his Christian faith is the martyr Stephen. And in Acts 7.55, Stephen, about to die, says that I see the heavens opened and, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father. It's the only time in the uh, post-ascension appearances of Jesus in heaven that he's said to be not seated to the right hand of the Father, but standing in honor of Stephen, who gave his life for his faith. That's a bit of Bible trivia. But here's what I want you to get. I want you to get that Jesus Christ, physically resurrected, physically alive as a resurrected human being, is positioned in a particular place at the right hand of the throne of God. But I, I, I thought Jesus was with me. And you're not, you're not wrong to say that he is. I think of a couple of passages. Matthew 18, 20 is the promise in a it's in a context of a of a congregation gathered to deal with the difficult matter of church discipline actually but the statement Jesus makes in Matthew 18:20 is if two or three of you gather in my name there am I in the midst of you well i have uh, i've been around christians for a long long time and i have been in more than i can count gatherings of more than two or three people gathered in Jesus name and the resurrected Christ, the man, Jesus Christ, who typically is seated at the right hand of the Father, hasn't shown up for any of those meetings. God the Son has not been there. And I'm not saying that Jesus got it wrong. Bear with me and don't write me hateful emails. I'm just saying the embodied, resurrected, physical man, Jesus Christ, I've never been in the room with him yet. Yet. In the Great Commission, at the end of the, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 28, 20, he makes a similar statement. He says, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, now, if he's a physically embodied, resurrected man, and he is, while he is still God the Son, and he is typically seated at the right hand of his Father in heaven, which, again, four times in the New Testament, he's said to be seated there, one time standing, but always at the right hand of God the Father. How is he always with me? Because he said he would be. Well, because the, the, the Trinitarian God, the triune God, is, in fact, one God, when he says, I, God the Father can say, I, and that I 
include God the Spirit and God the Son. God the Son can say I and mean God the Father and God the Spirit. God the Spirit can say I and include God the Son and God the Father. John 14, 20, part of the passage that we dealt with on a recent Sunday morning at McGregor. Jesus is talking to his disciples in the context of promising them the Spirit. And he says, in that day, that is the day that he comes to them in the form of the Spirit, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. The I in John 14, 20, out of the mouth of Jesus is a reference to God the Holy Spirit. So God the Holy Spirit allows us the the incredibly privileged position of all time, that is at all times, intimate, connected relationship, access to the living God. In fact, possession by the living God in the literal spirit possession sense, while at the same time preserving the important and unique truth of the physical, literal resurrection, ascension, and one day return of Jesus Christ. We can have it both ways because the God who is has chosen to reveal himself to us as God the Son and God the Spirit at the same time. So we have all the amazing truth of a literal resurrection and a literally ascended Christ. We have a literal man, Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of God the Father, standing in for us and interceding on our behalf. And at the same time, we have the spiritual presence of God the Holy Spirit in our heart. And while they are different persons of the Trinity, they're the same God. Um, years ago on Easter Sunday, we used to sometimes make the statement that Jesus is not dead and in this tomb, or dead and in the tomb, he's alive and in this room. And that used to bug me a little bit because I thought, no, because the Jesus that resurrected is not in this room because he's a man standing at the, or seated at the right hand of God the Father. God the Holy Spirit is in this room, and I was probably being a precise to the point of pickiness, but it's really, really important to guard the truth of the literal physical resurrection of Christ while at the same time guarding the truth of the intimate connected possession of the living God in the person of the Holy Spirit. And we can guard those both if we understand the Trinity correctly. Well, that was just something to think about. I pray that by now you have you have subscribed or liked this podcast. I hope you're sharing it with your friends. And if so, I'm glad. God bless you. And we look forward to the next time we're here together on Beyond the Notes. Happy Palm Sunday, church family. My name is Kim, and I want to welcome you to Sunday morning worship here at McGregor Baptist Church. If you are wanting to find out what's going on around McGregor, you can pick up one of our Around McGregor handouts here on campus, or if you're watching online, just head over to mcgregor.net slash around. There you can find upcoming things like VBS. We're gonna be celebrating God's greatness in our monumental VBS, June 13th through 17th. VBS is for three years to fifth grade, and the fun begins each night at 6.15 p.m. and wraps up at 8.15 p.m. The kids will be learning about the greatness of God from the Bible, having hands-on fun with the Imagination Station, and learning new songs each night. So moms, dads, and grandparents, don't wait. Pre-registration for your kids and grandkids is open now. Just go to mcgregor.net slash VBS. Also, we want to invite you to join us for a night of worship tonight as we worship together through singing, reading scripture, and praying as we praise Jesus for giving his life and prepare our hearts for corporate worship on Resurrection Sunday. No matter if you are new or have been with us before, you can connect with us wherever you are. You can like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram or find a connect card in the pew rack. Let's get ready and let's worship Jesus Christ together.
Good morning and happy Palm Sunday to you, church. We're glad you're here. Those online, we're thankful you're able to join us in that way. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? I want to invite you to stand with us. We sing Hosanna, praise is rising. We praise the God who saves us. Think about that this morning. There is one God who saves, and to him we shout Hosanna. Church, sing praise is rising. Praise is rising. seat church the church was and is not our idea and by extension this church McGregor Baptist well it's not our creation the church was conceived in the mind of 
Jesus Christ for, for his purposes. The purpose of the church, therefore, is, is always the same. It's the making of disciples for the glory of God. The elders of our church realize that we, we, we dare not construct a purpose for our church, but we can seek to articulate a purpose. The purpose we've articulated is this, by God's grace, we desire to glorify God by magnifying His Word to make disciples who think biblically, live missionally, give generously, and love sacrificially. The statement captures the mission of our church. Operating as in all things by the grace of God, we desire to glorify God. That's the heart of our purpose because, well, that's the heart of everything's purpose. Everything in God's creation ultimately exists to bring Him glory. The means whereby we bring Him glory is the making of disciples. And the principal tool that He's given us to make disciples is the Bible, His Holy Word. Thus, by His grace, we desire to glorify God by magnifying His Word to develop disciples. While we believe that the mission of the church and the means, God's Word, that we use to reach that mission are the same for every gospel-centered church. They're tied to the heart of God for the church. The measures each church employs can be, well, a bit unique. Different churches can and will employ different measures to accomplish our Lord's mission. Here at McGregor, we've, we've settled on four measures that we believe define the, the mission of discipleship for our church. The first of those measures is that we think biblically. The Bible should be our, our guide, our standard, our textbook. It's a love letter from God to His people, wherein He's told us everything we need to know to live out the life of a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. In fact, everything we can claim to know with certainty about God is contained in His written Word, the Bible. Therefore, it should always guide our thoughts, our attitudes, and our actions. To live missionally certainly includes sharing our faith locally in our day-to-day -day lives and globally as part of the worldwide mission of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it's more than that. To live missionally is to live your life, not mostly as a citizen of this world, but mostly as an ambassador representing our King to this world. Giving generously affects far more than just how we spend our money. It's, it's how we devote our, our time, our attention, and, and yes, our resources to things beyond our own agenda. It's, a, it's an intentional life of devotion to the needs of others. By itself, to love sacrificially, well, could be redundant because love understood biblically is always sacrificial. But we want to emphasize the intent to love in a sacrificial way. Love costs, but that's how Jesus has loved us. For the next several months, the ministries of McGregor will be working on incorporating this statement into their, their goals and strategy. And if you want to learn more about how the statement came to be, I'll be joining host Mark Bricker on an upcoming special episode of the Here at Home podcast. Meanwhile, please be in prayer for the elders and other leaders in the church as we seek to live out the purpose to which we believe the Lord has led us. God bless you. Well, I'm super excited about that, and uh, you'll be hearing a lot more in the days to come about how this will actually impact ministries and strategies and how we as McGregor are going to live under that, uh, that purpose statement that uh, Pastor Russell just shared with us. Uh, welcome to Palm Sunday. 
here at McGregor. Welcome to you, those of you that are watching online and welcome to everybody that's in the auditorium this morning. If you're a guest here this morning, we're so grateful that you're here. Maybe someone invited you to come. Maybe you just decided you wanted to, to visit church this morning. Well, we're grateful that you're here this morning. We have a Connect card in the pew rack in front of you. And if you are a guest, we, I would encourage you to take that Connect card and, and fill it out. It's a great way for for you to maybe get some more information about our church, and maybe you've got some questions, like to know a little bit more, whatever you ask, we'll get back with you. If, uh, if you don't want to know anything, that's fine. But uh, at the same time, we would encourage you to fill out that Connect card. Now, speaking of cards, I hope everybody has already grabbed some of those invite cards for Easter for next Sunday. Have you, have you got your invite card? If you haven't, We've got a bunch of them in, the, in all of the foyer areas as you leave. You can pick those up as you leave. What a great opportunity to take some time to intentionally invite a neighbor, a coworker, a, a friend, uh, a relative to service next Sunday uh, in any of our three services. And I would encourage you to do that. And speaking of Easter, today kicks off Passion Week, right? Palm Sunday. And it's an exciting time in the life uh, for those of us that, that worship Jesus and follow him. But I want to let you know some things that are going on a little bit unique for our church. Obviously, this morning is Palm Sunday, and part of the uniqueness this morning is that we're taking a two-week break from our sermon series in the Gospel of John. So if you've already thought you read ahead in John and what we would be looking at, sorry, put that on pause, and the Sunday after Easter, we'll be back in John. But for the next two weeks, we will be doing a little bit of a different to outside of that normal series. Also, tonight, there is a special worship um, night. Our worship ministry is putting on this night, and the intent and purpose of that is to help prepare our hearts for Easter coming up next Sunday. Also, to help prepare your heart for Easter is our Thursday night upper room service right here in the worship center at 6.30. By the way, tonight's uh, worship uh, night is at 5 o'clock, so make sure you get the times right, 5 o'clock. Uh, worship tonight, and then Thursday night, 6.30, again, right back here in the worship center for our upper room. And because of that, we won't be having any activities on Wednesday night, just so you know that nothing on Wednesday, but we'll be here on Thursday night. We'll also be celebrating the Lord's Supper as part of that upper room service. So I hope you can be here for that Thursday upper room service. And then obviously on Sunday, we'll gather together corporately to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's going to be an awesome week, and I hope and pr pray that today begins your preparation for this entire week leading to the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. I want to also just remind us as we prepare now for our offertory, and I say offertory, it's uh, as we, you know, we're not going to pass any plates, but we have the opportunity as the body of Christ, as we just heard Pastor Russell say, to give generously. And I had a chance this past week to witness a brother in Christ going out of his way to, to use some of his own resources to help a fellow brother. And it blessed me to see that, but it also challenged me that we're all called to use our, our resources, our time, all these things that we have, not just for our own agenda, as Russell said in the, in the video, but for the benefit of God's kingdom and for others. And so I would encourage you as we pray now to consider how you can give generously, both to the church, but to the others around you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together this morning to worship Jesus. And really, that's why we're here this morning, to be able to, to, to put aside the distractions of the world for a little while and lift up the name of Jesus high above every other name, above every other thing that will vie for our attention. And God, I pray that as we do that, we'll understand that part of our worship is not just singing, but it's also giving, giving with our lives, giving with our resources, giving with our time. God, that we would be found generous givers as a follower of you. God, I pray again that you would just bless this time together this morning. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Amen. We stand with us this morning as we continue to worship God together. Say Hosanna to King Jesus.
out praise to King Jesus. Hosanna. Glory to God in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is a declaration of praise. It means praise Jesus and also means we see in Hebrew it means save us. Some 2,000 plus years ago on a Palm Sunday or a day in which Christ entered Jerusalem, he walked in and people shouted, Hosanna, save us, save me. We have the, the privilege of now knowing the full narrative. We've seen the story play out. We've seen, we have the gospel on full display. I wonder this morning, have you cried out, save me? Have you cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest? Perhaps you have in this, this Easter season, this Passion Week, this time of year has almost jolted you out of your, your mundane reality in which you're navigating this life, and things are tough. Things are difficult. It's a tough season. Maybe you need to cry out anew to Jesus this morning, save me. Save me from myself. Save me from this pattern of, of trying to find satisfaction on my own. Save me from this incredible delusion that I can make it apart from you. We're reminded this morning from God's word, 1 John 5 and verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know the true one. We are in the true one that is in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. You believe that this morning, church? He is the true God and eternal life. Hope conquers heartbreak. The morning always follows the night. There is none above him. There is none before him. He is King of kings and he is Lord of lords. The question this morning is, will you trust him? We can trust him with your life. We can trust him with you each and every day. We praise our God who is the Ancient of Days. We praise you and you alone, the God who saves us.
Ancient of days, mighty God, we praise you this morning. There's none before you, none above you. No one that can be your rival, no one that equals your worth. This Palm Sunday, we celebrate that you came. We celebrate that you came once. We praise you for what's coming this week. And we celebrate that you are coming again. It's risen and reigning eternal King. Lord God, we love you. May we be amazed this morning that the God who saves knows our name. The God who saves cares about our eternity. All the power, all the glory, God, I will trust in your name. We love you, Lord. Thankful for your son. It's in the mighty name of King Jesus, we together pray and all God's people said, amen. We see the church. The Easter season recounts the preparation of Jesus as the Passover lamb and moves from the sacrifice on the cross to the celebration of a risen Savior. What did the cross and resurrection achieve? In a word, life. Christ's saving work on our behalf is the good news of eternal life. And this good news calls each of us to faith and repentance. Christianity rests on the certainty of Jesus' resurrection. Just as Jesus said, because I live, you also will live. Have you ever noticed that we all have the tendency to, to boast, to brag a little bit? Now, I know some of you are like, no, I don't, I don't ever boast, I don't ever brag. And some of you probably can honestly say that. And, but think about how we might boast and how we might brag, because sometimes we're not even boasting in ourselves. Maybe we're boasting in someone else. And so here's one I find a lot of people can be found guilty. You like to boast about your kids, your children. Or what about your grandparents? Come on now, I hear a lot of boasting going on from grandparents about their grandchildren. We all have that tendency to boast, and, and some of us have a tendency to want people to know what we have achieved, what we have accomplished. And I started thinking about that this week. Do I, do I tend to do that, and, and, and where are areas that I tend to boast in? So I thought I'd be a little transparent with you as I get started, because I can fall into this trap just as easy as anybody else. Uh, it, it was about three years ago that we needed a new dishwasher, and we were there at Lowe's or Home Depot, you know, picking out our dishwasher and and, and finding out the cost, and then after we found out the cost, they said, well, it'll be another 200 and something dollars to install it. I said, $200 to install it? I looked at Macy, I said, I think I can do that. <laughs> However, I, you know, I'm not a handyman. I really am not. That, that's not one of the things that I'm, I'm not, I wish I was one of those people that can fix anything and do that. I'm not that, that person. But I'm pretty proud of myself that it's been three plus years and that dishwasher still is working and still hasn't leaked. <laughs> I was able to pull it off. And it's funny how we talk about dishwashers and I'm able to work that into the conversation almost every time now for three years. And I just did it in a sermon too. So see, I have a tendency to boast and to brag. And I think we all have that same tendency. And if you're a competitive person, ooh, watch out because you really have to watch out. And have you ever been in a group of people where there, there's a conversation and there's always, not always, oftentimes there's that person that always wants to one-up whatever anybody said? You know, you say, well, I just had, had my knee replaced. And I said, oh, that's nothing. I had both mine replaced. You know, they're always trying to one-up. They got a little that competitive edge. Now, here's the deal. And, I, and I, I share this little humorous little opening just so that we're all aware that we all have a tendency to boast and to brag about our achievements, about our work accomplishments, about our hobbies, about uh, things that we own, our possessions. We all have that tendency to boast a little bit. But as we get started, we're going to be looking in, 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 in the book of Romans in just a minute. But before we get to that, I want to read a verse from Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Because when we think about our tendency to boast... It's such a sharp contrast to what Paul says in Galatians 6, verse 14. He says, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Far be it from me to boast. Paul understood the human tendency that we want to boast about something. 
That's kind of built into our, our sin nature, our pride that we want to boast, we want to brag. And Paul says, far be it from me to boast. I'm not going to boast about anything unless it's about what Christ did for us on the cross. So my question this morning is, what are you boasting in? What are you boasting in? What are you bragging about? What do you talk about? What are things that you are letting other people know that are important to you? And maybe the better question is, when was the last time you boasted in the cross? When was the last time that you bragged about what Jesus did for you on the cross? This is Palm Sunday, and we're celebrating Palm Sunday in the sense that this was the day on the timeline that begins Passion Week where Jesus entered into Jerusalem for the final time. And so as we celebrate this, as we study God's word this morning, my desire is that we would focus and prepare our hearts on celebrating the resurrection next Sunday. Now, the cross is central to our faith. That's why we're called to boast in the cross. It's central to our faith. But why is it so central to our faith? It's foundational. In fact, you take away the cross, you have no Christianity. Why is it that Christian use the cross as a symbol. Why? Do you ever wonder that? Why not, a, why not a, a, a manger? Why not an empty tomb? Why are we not wearing empty tomb symbols around our necks? It's because the cross, early on the Christians realized that the cross was so central, so foundational, so critical to their faith. And so that's why we should boast in the cross. And so this morning, Romans chapter six, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Romans Chapter 5, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 5. We're going to begin in verse 6 in just a minute. But I want us to see, as we talk about the cross, that we would have the opportunity this morning to hear why the cross is central to our faith. And we're going to see on the cross both God's amazing love and God's atoning work. And you see the big idea, if you have, your, if you have the notes there in front of you, the big idea is that we boast in the cross this is why we boast in the cross. We boast in the cross because of God's amazing love demonstrated through his atoning work on the cross. And that big idea really is our outline that we're going to see God's amazing love, God's atoning work, and then our response to all of that. So with your Bibles open, look at first verse eight. We're going to come back and read six through eight in just a second. But I want you to look at verse eight because if we're calling this amazing love, I want to be able to prove to you that this truly is amazing love by unpacking these verses, but the key is found in verse 8. When, when Paul says, but God shows his love for us, there's the word love, God shows his word love, shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If we're honest, it's hard to love somebody that doesn't love us back, right? It's hard. It's difficult. It's a whole lot easier if, I, if I'm trying to love you and you're responding with love back to me. And in fact, that's kind of the way our culture defines love is that you love somebody that loves you. But as believers, we're called to love agape love. And that's the same love that God has for us. And what's amazing about this is we see that God loved us while we were still sinners. And we're gonna break that down in just a minute to really see how amazing this love is. But just remember how difficult it is for you to love somebody that's not loving back to you, or even that's just neutral. It's difficult to love them. But that's what God did, plus a whole, whole lot more. Let's read now verses six through eight together. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The first thing I want us to see here is his unconditional love. God's unconditional love. Paul wanted to boast about what, what God had done for us on the cross. And he makes it real clear here that to understand why we would boast about what Christ has done for us, why we could call this amazing love, we have to really understand our condition outside of Jesus Christ. And what a great reminder for all of us, even if, you're, even if you've been a believer for, for 40, 50 years, to be reminded of who we are outside of Jesus Christ 
helps us to appreciate his love for us even more. And he gives us three words in these three verses. He begins in verse six and he says, while we were still weak. And so we are weak. Outside of Christ, we are weak. And that word could better be translated without strength or powerless. Because when we think of weak, we say, well, I'm just a little weak right now. Maybe you went to the gym and you weren't able to lift the, the, the weights that you normally did. So he's, I'm just a little weak today. But that's not really a good definition of that term weak. We are powerless without strength. We grab the weight, but we can't even pick it up at all. That's what he's describing here. We're weak, we're powerless. And that is in relationship to our own ability to save ourselves. We can do nothing to save ourselves. It's only what Christ has done for us. Amen? That's the amazing truth of the gospel. And Paul wants us to understand how weak and powerless we are. In fact, over in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says that we were dead in our transgressions and sin. Not only are we weak, we're dead. And talk about, you know, think about it, a corpse. A corpse can't do anything, right? And that's how we are when it comes to our own salvation, that we can do nothing. The second thing is we see we are ungodly. We are ungodly. He says in that same verse 6, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. And that, that word ungodly means unrighteousness, unloving. We're at odds against God. We are rebelling against God and his authority. Later in verse 10, he says that we were enemies. And so we are weak, we are ungodly, we're unrighteous, we're at odds against God. And then he says in verse 8 that while we were still sinners. And to sin means to miss the mark, right? To miss the mark of God's standard. But to be a sinner means that we are in a constant state of missing the mark. Can anybody relate to that? I mean, think I, I know I can, that I constantly miss the mark. And yet, in spite of the ungodliness and the unrighteousness and the weakness, we can do nothing on our own. The fact that we're a sinner, that's the condition that Paul paints here and makes it so clear how undeserving we truly are of God's love. And it's against this backdrop of our true condition as a sinner in rebellion against God that we can only truly begin to appreciate God's amazing and unconditional love for me. How could God love a sinner like me? How could he? I, I can't speak for you, but I know my own heart. I know my own failures. How could God love a sinner like me with that kind of unconditional love? It should, it should blow our minds when we think about how much he loves us and what he's done for us. That love that Paul talks about here when he says that God loved us even while we were still sinners, that's the, the word agape love, that unconditional type of love We've used the phrase around here to define the love. Uh, in fact, I, I believe it was just last week, Pastor Russell, you used it, that love is an unconditional, self-sacrificial commitment to the well-being of another. And here's the application for us as believers as we hopefully get a sense of the overwhelmingness of God's love, that unconditional love for us as sinners, that we will be compelled to love others in the same way. Just a few chapters ago in our study of John, John 13, Jesus says, I get a new command I give you to what? Love one another. And he goes on and he says, love one another just as I have loved you. And the implications of that, even though the disciples heard that, later on they would realize, well, wait a minute, he was willing to lay down his life for us in love. What am I willing to do for my brother, my sister? The call to unconditional love for one another. Can you imagine a body of Christ that's living out that kind of love on a continual basis? That we would truly love sacrificially? You remember hearing that just a few minutes ago in the video? That we would love in that kind of manner. And speaking of sacrifice, letter B, his sacrificial love we see here. His sacrificial love. It was unconditional. We did not deserve it. But it also was sacrificial in nature. Verse 8, we see at the end of that that Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He showed us his love, that unconditional love. He demonstrated it by sending his son, Jesus, to die on the cross. That's a sacrifice. We talk about sacrifice, and we, we talk about, well, I have, to, I have to give up a little time doing this, or I'm going to have to sacrifice so I won't have enough money to buy this. Or, and we talk about sacrifice at that kind of level. 
But when you think about the level of sacrifice of Jesus coming into this world, living a perfect, sinless life, being both fully God and fully human, living a perfect, sinless life, and going to the cross and laying down his very own life for me. Talk about a costly gift. Talk about a precious gift. Talk about a rare gift that God would give his only son and the expense of that gift that he would shed his own blood. That's the sacrificial nature of God's demonstration of love. I did not deserve it. I still don't deserve it. But yet that's the kind of love that God demonstrated. In case you're missing this, Paul gives a little commentary in verse seven. He says for, in verse seven, he says, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. And essentially what he's saying is just helping us to understand the depth of this sacrifice. The people don't die for people that hate them. People don't die for their avowed enemies that are trying to battle against them, Right? Rarely will someone die for a good person. Rarely will someone die for someone they love. But who's going to die for somebody that hates them? And even though that analogy breaks down a little bit, it still helps us see the depth of God's sacrifice in sending his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross. God's love for me is both unconditional and sacrificial. And I'm called to love you, my brothers and sisters, in the same way, to love you unconditionally and to love you sacrificially. And we're all called to do that together. But we won't do that. We'll struggle to do that until we realize God's amazing love for us first. Pause for just a moment. Intermission. Not really intermission. I don't want you leaving. This week on Beyond the Notes, it comes out on Tuesday. I'm going to do something a little bit different. Uh, Normally, we share some things that we just didn't have time to get to in the message today. But this week, I'm going to share some things to help you prepare for the Easter celebration next week. So we're going to spend some time talking about some resources, some ideas, some thoughts that you can use for the next several days leading up to Easter. So I would encourage you to join me on that journey next Tuesday during the Beyond the Notes podcast. Also, I put some resources at the bottom of your outline on the back page, and I would encourage you to take advantage of these resources. Now, the problem is, if you're going to go try to order a book, it takes a few days to get here, and Easter's almost here, right? But the first one, Journey to the Cross by Paul David Tripp, is an excellent devotional book. I'm going through it for the second time this Easter season, and it is just fantastic. And the other one's a brand new book that I, I don't think it's new, but it's new to me, The Heart of the Cross by two authors, Riken and Boyce, that has really been good as I've prepared this, this message, but also just in my own private devotional time as well as I prepare for Easter. So those are two resources I would recommend. All right, back to the outline. Roman numeral two, God's atoning work. We've seen God's amazing love demonstrated on the cross, and now we're gonna look at his atoning work that we can experience based on what he did on the cross. Let's read verses nine through 11 together. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So because of God's amazing love demonstrated on the cross, we can experience his atoning work on the cross. And we use that word atonement a lot. And I want to make sure we understand what we mean when we use that word atonement. Atonement is Christ's death on the cross. Christ's death on the cross as a substitutionary sacrifice for our sin. It's Christ's death on the cross as a substitutionary sacrifice for our sin our sin. Jesus bore God's wrath in our place. He paid the penalty that we could never pay. That's the atonement of Jesus Christ. And so Paul's talking about that and he's bringing out this substitutionary atoning work on the cross that he, that that Jesus has provided. And he uses two words to help us understand what Christ accomplished on the cross. And the two words we're going to look at are justify and reconcile. Justify and reconcile. Now, the word justify 
speaks to the judicial nature of what Christ did on the cross. The word reconcile speaks to the relational nature of what Christ accomplished on the cross. And Paul builds his argument in parallel here, parallel here talking about the justification and the reconciliation that is available through what Christ has done on the cross. So let's start with the first one, letter A, we are justified. We are justified. And by the way, justification is really, really good news. This is really, really good news. Because remember our condition apart from Christ, that we were weak, helpless to achieve salvation on our own, that we were ungodly, unrighteous, unloving, and we were sinners destined to spend eternity separated from God in hell. That's what we deserved outside of Jesus Christ. But here's the cool part about the justification part, because when we are justified by his blood, when we are justified, our position changes. It changes. We move from guilty to not guilty. In fact, that word justify means declared not guilty. But it also means declared righteous as well. So we move from guilty to not guilty, from unrighteous to righteous. That's an amazing thought. That's a radical shift. That's a radical change. As a guilty, unrighteous sinner heading straight to hell, the justification that I receive because of the blood of Jesus Christ moves me from that to not guilty and righteous. What an amazing thought, amen? I mean, that should get us excited because there's nothing I could do in myself to move from guilty to not guilty. And by the way, every world religion, just about all put together a system of things that you must do or can do to achieve eternal life, etern uh, having peace with God, or whatever, however they describe it. But that's the beauty of the gospel is it's what Jesus has done for us on the cross, the shedding of his blood that we can be made not guilty and righteous. And notice the means by which that justifying work is accomplished, by his blood. It's the sacrificial, substitutionary death of Jesus on the cross that justifies us. Again, it goes against everything we, every fiber in our being because we want to try to justify ourselves. But we can't. It's only by the blood of Jesus Christ that anybody's made right. Tonight, I mentioned earlier in the announcement that we're gonna have a, uh, a, a worship night here at five o'clock. And there's a song that's gonna be sung tonight entitled, No Other Fount. No Other Fount. And I wanted to share some of the words because these lyrics point to the justifying work of Jesus' blood shed on the cross. And here's, the, here's some of the lyrics from that, that song. Nothing can for sin atone. Hope is found in you alone. Sin and death are overcome only by your precious blood. Only your blood has the power. There is no other, no other fount I know. Jesus, your love, there's the love. Jesus, your love made a way. No other fount I know can save. Paul's not finished here. It's almost like Paul says, but wait, there's more. The last part of verse nine, he says, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? And he's using an argument here from the, the greater to the lesser, meaning that if God, through the shedding of, of his son's Jesus' blood on the cross, is able to justify us, move us from guilty to not guilty, unrighteous to righteous, then he can spare us his wrath as well. How much more will we be able to experience being spared God's wrath? And by the way, God's wrath is something that every sinner deserves, right? Right? That's God's judgment for all sinners. His judgment, his wrath, eternal separation in hell. That's, that's the judgment for all sinners. Anybody outside of Christ. And so Paul is just simply saying, hey, good news once again. Not only did you move from guilty to not guilty, you're gonna be spared one day God's coming wrath. Letter B, we are also reconciled. So we are justified by his blood, moved from guilty to not guilty, but we are also reconciled. And so from the judicial term to the more relational term here, we see that we are reconciled. Verse 10 says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So Paul moves out of the courtroom into the home. And to be reconciled is to restore a relationship. And there's nothing sweeter than to have a relationship that was once wrecked or destroyed to be restored back. 
There's something precious about that. And that's what Paul is describing here, that not only are we justified, moving from guilty to not guilty, unrighteous to righteous, but now that, recon- that, re- that, that relationship between us and God, that we were at one time an enemy, now it, we are his friend. It's been restored. One of the lyrics of the songs that, we sing, that we'll sing a little bit later is that once I was his enemy, but now I sit at his table. And I love that imagery. And that's what this reconciliation is all about. And when you think about reconciliation, there's now peace in that relationship. And to be reconciled with God means we are at peace with God. In fact, if you look back in in Romans chapter 5, the very first verse, it says this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reconciliation that we get to enjoy. That relationship aspect that we can, we can have with God, the creator of the universe. Even though I'm still a sinner, even though I still am gonna mess up, I now have this personal relationship. We use that phrase a lot, don't we? We have this personal relationship through Jesus Christ to God the Father. What an amazing thought that we've gone from an enemy to a friend, an enemy to his children, the ones he loves, the ones he cares for that we can have that peace, that relationship. Justification, our legal standing, reconciliation, our personal relationship with our Father in home. So what's our response? What is our response? I love what Paul says here in verse 11. He says, again, more than that. He says, but wait, (laughs) there's more. More than that, we also rejoice In God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So what is your response going to be to God's amazing love? What is your response going to be to God's atoning work in your life? How are you going to respond to that? Well, I want to respond like Paul responded. And I said at the beginning that, you know, we talked about we all have a tendency to boast. But Paul said, I'm not going to boast in anything but the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's where we come back to at this point. That same big idea that we boast in the cross. We boast in the cross. Why? Because of God's amazing love demonstrated through his atoning work on the cross. And you say, well, where do, where do we see the word boast in our passage? You, you use that in Galatians 6.14, but where do we see boast in this passage? Well, that's the cool part because in that verse I just read, verse 11, when you, re- when you read that, he says, we also rejoice. And that word rejoice there in verse 11 is the exact same Greek word that Paul used in Galatians 6, 14 when he used the word, when it's translated boast. It's the same word. It's that same word. And, and that word has a lot of different connotations. It, it can be used to boast, to rejoice, to live in, to glory in. It's a deep, rich word. And I think that's what our response needs to be. That we would say, I want to glory in the cross. I want to boast in the cross. I want to live in the presence of the cross. I want the cross to be my my obsession. And that's really what, when you boast about something, it becomes an obsession. And that's what our obsession needs to be, is what Christ has done for us on the cross. That we would respond that way with him. Is that your response this morning? Did you want to boast? Did you want to glory in the cross? I hope and pray it is. I hope and pray that maybe more so now than when you walked in the room. And I hope and pray maybe more so tomorrow and the next day and the next day that you have a a deeper understanding of what God has done for you through his son, Jesus Christ, and that you can't help yourself but wanting to glorify in the cross and boast in the cross and share with others about what Christ has done for you at the cross. That would be our natural response. Now, if you're here this morning and you're listening to what we've been talking about and what we've been studying and you're thinking, well, that's not that big a deal, then maybe, maybe just, maybe you haven't truly recognized your sin condition. Because if you're here this morning outside of Jesus Christ, I would consider, challenge you to consider God's amazing love for you and his atoning work on the cross that transforms us. His love for us and his transforming power. My prayer for you this morning is that you would truly recognize your sin condition, 
that you don't have a chance on your own to get to God. There's nothing you can do or anybody can do to get to God on their own. It's only by recognizing what he's already done for us. And that's my prayer for you, that if you're outside of Christ, that you would recognize your sin condition, that you can't get to God on your own, and that you would repent, turn from that sin, and put your faith and trust in Christ and his atoning work on the cross, and you would put your faith totally and trust totally in him and what he's done for you. That's my prayer for you this morning. But for those of us that are here that have already made that kind of commitment to follow Christ with our lives, I want to challenge you in another way. I want to challenge you to, to reflect on what God has done for you through the cross. And that the, 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 the attitude or the, the spirit of gratitude would begin to well up. How thankful you are. Now, we're thankful for a lot of things, right? But there should be nothing that, that supersedes our gratitude and our thanksgiving to what Christ did for us on the cross. And that that would be what you would think about. We're going to sing a song in just a minute entitled Jesus Thank You. This is going to be our response song. And I want to read the chorus to you as we prepare to sing this. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. God, thank you so much for your amazing love demonstrated through your atoning work on the cross. God, let us never take that for granted. Let us this season meditate, reflect on all that you have done for us through your son Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. And as we continue in an attitude of response and worship, would you stand with us as we thank Jesus for his love, thank Jesus for the cross. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agony of Calvary You the perfect Holy One Crushed your Son Who drank the bitter cup Reserved for me Your blood has washed away my sin Jesus stay
seated at your table. Aren't you thankful the cross of Jesus Christ satisfied the Father's wrath? This week, as you prepare for Passion Week, as you prepare for Easter Sunday, don't forget, as you leave, take some invite cards, invite some people to come join us next Sunday. Join us tonight at 5 o'clock for an evening of worship you're not going to want to miss. And join us this Thursday, Upper Room Service, right here at 6.30. God bless. Have an awesome life group. Finally, good news. The Easter season speaks of the most hope-filled thing that has ever happened. The good news of Jesus' resurrection is a saving hope that we all need. There's no place like McGregor Baptist Church to celebrate Easter Sunday in worship and Bible study this Easter season. And we can't wait to meet you at one of our in-person services. Our McGregor Church family is here for you and your family. So join us on Sunday, April 17th at one of our worship services at 8, 9.30 or 11 a.m. We hope to see you there. One of the deepest mysteries of the Christian faith is the triune or Trinitarian nature of God. Uh, and there's something very, very special to be seen in the relationship between God the Son and God the Spirit and the believer. And we're going to talk about that today on Beyond the Notes. I'm Pastor Russell Howard, and I'm really, really glad you're with us today. The, uh, the Trinity is, is a difficult and mysterious concept. It just is. One of the things that is, is said of the Trinity, and, and I believe it's, it's a correct statement, of course it's a correct statement, is that there's the, the fact of the Trinity, that God is, is one personality that expresses himself in three persons, is, is what's called an irreducible fact. It's it's the universe's central irreducible fact that the God who is is a triune God. What that means is he, he defies metaphor. You can't say the Trinity is like this or that or the other because there are all kinds of, of heresy you get into very, very quickly when you try to force a mold onto the Trinity. There is one God. We do not worship three gods. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are all God, not in the sense that all three of them are equally God, but in the sense that they are all the same one God. And if that makes your head feel like it's going to you know, slightly stretch to the point of exploding, you're probably seeing it correctly. It's, a, it's an interesting concept. And as we looked at the passage this week on Sunday morning, this back half of John 14, where Jesus promises the coming Holy Spirit, it, it led me to want to peer more deeply into something for a moment that I thought would be a really, really good place to take this week's Beyond the Notes. Let me, let me pose a question. The question is, where is Jesus right now? Where is Jesus right now? You know, Easter is coming up in just a little while, and one of the most important, distinctive truths we, we guard and express, the Bible is clear about it, that the, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a physical resurrection, that the body that went into that grave on Friday came out of that grave on Sunday, albeit glorified, a very different form and a very sort of the eternal glorified version of that body. But, but 1 Corinthians 15, for example, makes it clear that what happened to Jesus on Easter Sunday as he walked out of his grave physically is the basis and the model for the physical resurrection of all believers. This is not a, a spiritual event. What came out of the grave was not some, you know, Jesus, the, the ghost. It was Jesus, the man, Jesus Christ. 
and the the one that spent those those days with his disciples, those 40 days after the resurrection, was the physically embodied man, Jesus Christ. He, he demonstrated some supernatural capabilities. He could travel very, very quickly. Uh, he could literally walk through walls, but he was not a spirit being. He was a physically embodied uh, John 21. He sits on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and eats some fish with the guys. So this is an embodied, physical, resurrected eternally durable body like you and I will one day have in the resurrection. So, and, and that is the Jesus that ascended in Acts chapter one, when he, when he flew up into the clouds at, um, on the side of the Mount of Olives there facing Jerusalem. So we, we must guard the physical resurrection of Jesus and the physical reality of what 1 Timothy 2, 5 calls our intercessor the man, Jesus Christ. In his present form, he is a man. Well, where, where is he? Well, we don't have to wonder about that. Now, set aside for a moment what you know about the fundamental omnipresence of God. And hang on, because this is an Easter truth that is to be preserved. Hang on to your understanding that Jesus Christ is a resurrected human being at this moment. At this moment, in the spring of 2022, Jesus is a resurrected human being. And Ephesians 1.20, Colossians 3.1, Hebrews 8.1, and Hebrews 12.2 all unite in telling us that, that that resurrected Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father in the throne room of the universe with God the Father. One time, by the way, as a fun footnote, he is depicted as standing beside the throne of God the Father, and that is when he welcomes the first martyr, Stephen the first person aside from Jesus himself to die for his Christian faith is the martyr Stephen. And in Acts 7.55, Stephen, about to die, says that I see the heavens opened and, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father. It's the only time in the uh, post-ascension appearances of Jesus in heaven that he's said to be not seated to the right hand of the Father, but standing in honor of Stephen, who gave his life for his faith. That's a bit of Bible trivia. But here's what I want you to get. I want you to get that Jesus Christ, physically resurrected, physically alive as a resurrected human being, is positioned in a particular place at the right hand of the throne of God. But I, I, I thought Jesus was with me. And you're not, you're not wrong to say that he is. I think of a couple of passages. Matthew 18, 20 is the promise in a it's in a context of a of a congregation gathered to deal with the difficult matter of church discipline actually but the statement Jesus makes in Matthew 18:20 is if two or three of you gather in my name there am I in the midst of you well i have uh, i've been around christians for a long long time and i have been in more than i can count gatherings of more than two or three people gathered in Jesus name and the resurrected Christ, the man, Jesus Christ, who typically is seated at the right hand of the Father, hasn't shown up for any of those meetings. God the Son has not been there. And I'm not saying that Jesus got it wrong. Bear with me and don't write me hateful emails. I'm just saying the embodied, resurrected, physical man, Jesus Christ, I've never been in the room with him yet. Yet. In the Great Commission, at the end of the, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 28, 20, he makes a similar statement. He says, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, now, if he's a physically embodied, resurrected man, and he is, while he is still God the Son, and he is typically seated at the right hand of his Father in heaven, which, again, four times in the New Testament, he's said to be seated there, one time standing, but always at the right hand of God the Father. How is he always with me? Because he said he would be. Well, because the, the, the Trinitarian God, the triune God, is, in fact, one God, when he says, I, 
God the Father can say I, and that I include God the Spirit and God the Son. God the Son can say I and mean God the Father and God the Spirit. God the Spirit can say I and include God the Son and God the Father. John 14, 20, part of the passage that we dealt with on a recent Sunday morning at McGregor, Jesus is talking to his disciples in the context of promising them the Spirit. And he says, in that day, that is the day that he comes to them in the form of the Spirit, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. The I in John 14, 20, out of the mouth of Jesus is a reference to God the Holy Spirit. So God the Holy Spirit allows us the the incredibly privileged position of all time, that is at all times, intimate, connected relationship, access to the living God. In fact, possession by the living God in the literal spirit possession sense while at the same time preserving the important and unique truth of the physical, literal resurrection, ascension, and one day return of Jesus Christ. We can have it both ways because the God who is has chosen to reveal himself to us as God the Son and God the Spirit at the same time. So we have all the amazing truth of a literal resurrection and a literally ascended Christ. We have a literal man, Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of God the Father, standing in for us and interceding on our behalf. And at the same time, we have the spiritual presence of God, the Holy Spirit in our heart. And while they are different persons of the Trinity, they're the same God. Um, Years ago on Easter Sunday, we used to sometimes make the statement that Jesus is not dead and in this tomb, or dead and in the tomb, he's alive and in this room. And that used to bug me a little bit because I thought, no, because the Jesus that resurrected is not in this room because he's a man standing at the, or seated at the right hand of God the Father. God the Holy Spirit is in this room, and I was probably being a precise to the point of pickiness, but it's really, really important to guard the truth of the literal physical resurrection of Christ while at the same time guarding the truth of the intimate connected possession of the living God in the person of the Holy Spirit. And we can guard those both if we understand the Trinity correctly. Well, that was just something to think about. I pray that by now you have you have subscribed or liked this podcast. I hope you're sharing it with your friends. And if so, I'm bless you. And we look forward to the next time we're here together on Beyond the Notes. What does God think about the unborn? Is there a biblical case for abortion? And if so, how does it line up with science? Welcome to Talk Truth, a McGregor podcast where we dive into scripture, gain insight from community, and biblically answer life questions. Talk Truth will answer life questions submitted by our listeners every other week. If you have a question for Talk Truth, you can submit your questions on our website. I'm your host, Chloe Weimer. Let's open the word, gather together, and talk some truth. I am joined by my good friend, Jamie Holmes, a wife and mother of two and an RN. Also joining me is my friend and co-worker, Mr. David Asfor, who is a husband, a father, and science teacher. David, what do you teach again? Biology, marine biology, anatomy, and aquaculture. Okay. And what is your education in? Uh, Bachelor's degree in biology, and I went to grad school for marine biology. Gotcha. Okay. So this is a very diverse group of people, I would say. But um, I think that with both of your backgrounds and your education, we're going to be able to talk about abortion um, with like a well-rounded perspective. Quite honestly, I am not a science gal, and I'm going to be real honest about that. Um, But 
I think that that's okay because I'm learning from you guys. So I'm probably going to be sitting over here and just like nodding and being like, wow, yeah, <laughs> in agreement. <laughs> Um, but we are going to be talking today about the science behind abortion, which will resonate with a lot of people in a personal sense. And when Talk Truth speaks on real life issues like this, we want to do exactly what the name says. We want to talk truth, but we want to talk truth in love and we want to defend our faith with gentleness and respect. Like we've talked about in previous episodes about defending our faith and people listening to this may feel, um, I just want to make it like clear, even just with us, like they're, they're going to be experiencing a lot of emotions, especially if they have had an abortion or if they have a close friend or a family member who has. And so we just want to be mindful of the way that we approach the topic. Um, and keep that in mind. Um, but also if you are listening to this, know that we aren't going to be talking about this in the sense that we are approaching the question the way that our opinions are, are, are approaching the question. It's, it's how does, how would God respond to abortion? And, and the way that we know that is because he has made it extremely clear in his word. He's also made it, I mean, he, he reveals himself in two ways, both in creation, but also in the word. And if you want to hear God speak, open your Bible and, and read it. And if you want to hear his audible voice, you can read your Bible out loud and hear his voice too. So that's what we're um, going to be talking about. And I want to keep that in mind. Um, but also know if, if you are listening to this, make sure you hold on to the end because we are going to talk about how God um, can and will redeem it. These, these, this conversation, it's going to be we're going to be in some deep waters and treading through some things that are difficult. Um, but God has a way of, I mean, he, he meets us in the water, comes down, comes down in it with us by sending his son to die on the cross. And he picks us up when we didn't even know that we were drowning and brings us on solid ground. And he, he provides redemption for our sins and our guilt and our shame. And every, all, all of us sitting at this table have experienced that. And, um, I just, if you're listening to this, I hope that you, you hold on if, if this makes you uncomfortable because know that Jesus does redeem it. So all that to be said, um, I'm going to pray and we're just going to dive right in. All right. So let's go to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for, um, just meeting us in um, our, our drowning and bringing us to solid ground. And I just ask that you give us wisdom as we talk about a, a really touchy subject and you help us to um, just speak truth, but speak truth in love. In Jesus name, amen. All right. So here on Talk Truth, we like to start with definitions. And I looked up what abortion is. And the first thing that came up was the Oxford dictionary definition, and it is the deliberate termination of a human pregnancy, most often performed during the first 28 weeks of pregnancy. And so the whole reason this episode came about was because, um, David and I were working a couple weeks ago and somehow we got started about what you were teaching in class. And I think it was on gender. And we started talking about like the semantics of gender and sexuality and how that word has been morphed by our culture and people have just, you know, so can you just talk about like the semantics with abortion and even words like embryo, fetus, baby, and even, even murder, if, if you want to go ahead and talk about that. Yeah, with, with most of those terms, uh, starting with uh, zygote, really, that's one you didn't throw in there. It's Ooh. a new one for you. But uh, that's basically when uh, a sperm and an egg fuse uh, at that moment or you know, minutes or hours later, it's a zygote. Then you have embryo, then you have fetus, then you have newborn. And something to remember about embryo and fetus, those are the two most commonly used terms in, in abortion. Those are just stages. Mm -hmm. We can't get hung up on the name and say that, well, because it's a different name, it's something different than what we are. Um, it's no different than when you, after birth, it's baby, infant, um, toddler, child. I mean, we have names for every stage of life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, young adult, middle age, whatever you want to call it. So embryo and fetus are the same thing. So. And, and this is actually part of the debate: is is an embryo is an embryo not a person? Yeah. Is a fetus not a person? Um, and so, embryo is uh, 
what is it? I'm thinking nine weeks. You may have to correct me on this. I, the numbers always get me, but embryo is basically, uh, if you just want to think about, forget the numbers, just think of it as an embryo is when the parts are being made. Mm -hmm. Fetus is when the parts are all there. They're just baking, so to speak. They're, they're maturing. They're getting to the point where they can uh, survive out of the womb at their best capacity. Um, and so functionally, that's what the difference between an embryo and a fetus is. But the question is, when, when is that, when are those stages, when are they classified as a human and when are they classified as a person? And I think those are two definitions that we have to definitely dive into. Happy Palm Sunday, church family. My name is Kim, and I want to welcome you to Sunday morning worship here at McGregor Baptist Church. If you are wanting to find out what's going on around McGregor, you can pick up one of our Around McGregor handouts here on campus, or if you're watching online, just head over to mcgregor.net slash around. There you can find upcoming things like VBS. We're gonna be celebrating God's greatness in our monumental VBS, June 13th through 17th. VBS is for three years to fifth grade, and the fun begins each night at 6.15 p.m. and wraps up at 8.15 p.m. The kids will be learning about the greatness of God from the Bible, having hands-on fun with the Imagination Station, and learning new songs each night. So moms, dads, and grandparents, don't wait. Pre-registration for your kids and grandkids is open now. Just go to mcgregor.net slash VBS. Also, we want to invite you to join us for a night of worship tonight as we worship together through singing, reading scripture, and praying as we praise Jesus for giving his life and prepare our hearts for corporate worship on Resurrection Sunday. No matter if you are new or have been with us before, you can connect with us wherever you are. You can like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram or find a connect card in the pew rack. Let's get ready and let's worship Jesus Christ together. church. Happy Palm Sunday to you. Are you glad to be here today? We're glad you're here. We're kicking off Passion Week. Amen. Every Sunday is a great day to gather as a body of Christ. But we're especially excited to kick off Passion Week together. Those online, thankful you're able to join us in that way. I want to invite you all. One of the ways we worship is through singing together corporately. Would you stand with us? We sing praise is rising. We worship the God who saves. We sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Hosanna to the Lord of Lords. Here we go. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you.
saves. Amen. You can have a seat. The church was and is not our idea. And by extension, this church, McGregor Baptist, well, it's not our creation. The church was conceived in the mind of Jesus Christ for, for His purposes. The purpose of the church, therefore, is, is always the same. It's the making of disciples for the glory of God. The elders of our church realize that we, we, we dare not construct a purpose for our church, but we can seek to articulate a purpose. The purpose we've articulated is this, by God's grace, we desire to glorify God by magnifying His Word to make disciples who think biblically, live missionally, Give generously and love sacrificially. The statement captures the mission of our church. Operating as in all things by the grace of God, we desire to glorify God. That's the heart of our purpose because, well, that's the heart of everything's purpose. Everything in God's creation ultimately exists to bring Him glory. The means whereby we bring Him glory is the making of disciples. And the principal tool that he's given us to make disciples is the Bible, his holy word. Thus, by his grace, we desire to glorify God by magnifying his word to develop disciples. While we believe that the mission of the church and the means, God's word, that we use to reach that mission are the same for every gospel-centered church. They're tied to the heart of God for the church. The measures each church employs can be, well, a bit unique. Different churches can and will employ different measures to accomplish our Lord's mission. Here at McGregor, we've, we've settled on four measures that we believe define the, the mission of discipleship for our church. The first of those measures is that we think biblically. The Bible should be our, our guide, our standard, our textbook. It's a love letter from God to His people, wherein He's told us everything we need to know to live out the life of a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. In fact, everything we can claim to know with certainty about God is contained in His written Word, the Bible. Therefore, it should always guide our thoughts, our attitudes, and our actions. To live missionally 
certainly includes sharing our faith locally in our day-to-day -day lives and globally as part of the worldwide mission of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it's more than that. To live missionally is to live your life, not mostly as a citizen of this world, but mostly as an ambassador representing our King to this world. Giving generously affects far more than just how we spend our money. It's, it's how we devote our, our time, our attention, and, and yes, our resources to things beyond our own agenda. It's, a, it's an intentional life of devotion to the needs of others. By itself, to love sacrificially, well, could be redundant because love understood biblically is always sacrificial. But we want to emphasize the intent to love in a sacrificial way. Love costs, but that's how Jesus has loved us. For the next several months, the ministries of McGregor will be working on incorporating this statement into their, their goals and strategy. And if you want to learn more about how the statement came to be, I'll be joining host Mark Bricker on an upcoming special episode of the Here at Home podcast. Meanwhile, please be in prayer for the elders and other leaders in the church as we seek to live out the purpose to which we believe the Lord has led us. God bless you. Good morning and welcome to McGregor Baptist Church on this Palm Sunday. And welcome to those of you that are joining us online as well. It's exciting to be here. We've already had a great time of worship. We're going to continue that in just a moment. But I wanted to go over a couple of things with you first. First of all, if you are a guest, we want to give you an extra welcome. Thank you so much for being here. There is a Connect card in the pew rack in front of you. And if, if you'd like to find out anything about our church, if you'd like to request some information or like someone even to maybe give you a call to ask some questions, use that Connect card. That's an opportunity for you to let us know you'd like some information. And at the end of the service, you can put that in the black offering bo boxes. They're at all the exits on your way out. And uh, we'll definitely get back in touch with you with any requests that you have. Speaking of cards, there are Easter invite cards that are available in all the foyers as you leave as well. And I would encourage all of us, self-included, that we be intentional in using those cards to invite, whether it's a friend, a family member, a coworker, a neighbor, somebody that doesn't have a church home to come and celebrate Easter with us on next Sunday. And so use those invite cards, pick them up, grab as many as you want. We'll keep making more, uh, but use those. Speaking of Easter, today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of Passion Week. And so there's a few things that are a little bit different moving forward. So I just wanted to kind of go through those with you very quickly. First of all, today is a little different in the sense that we're taking a break from our series in the Gospel of John. We've been doing that for quite a while, but we're going to take a two-week break today and next Sunday, and then we'll be right back in it, and we'll finish it up this fall. So just be aware of that. The next change is, well, not a change, the addition is tonight, an evening of worship and praise led by our worship ministry team. And you'll want to be here 5 o'clock right here in this room. The purpose of that, that time of praise is to prepare our hearts for the Easter celebration on Sunday. And also, another thing that I would encourage you to be a part of, not just Sunday, this, tonight at 5 o'clock, but this coming Thursday at 6.30, we have our upper room service. And we've been doing this for several years now. We have a time of reflecting, and we'll take the, celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And it'll also be a time of encouraging and reflecting and pointing us to the resurrection on Easter Sunday. And that's at 6.30 this Thursday. So a lot of different things happening this week. I hope you'll be able to participate in those as you can. Finally, I want to just, uh, the, the video we watched, the purpose statement, I, I'm super excited about that and how that can guide and direct McGregor Baptist Church to fulfill what God's called us to be as a church. But you probably noticed one of those uh, four measures that Pastor Russell mentioned was give generously. And it's during this time of the service where we talk about our offering. We talk about giving. I had the opportunity this past month to see a brother give very generously to help a brother in need. And it just reminded me that that's what we're called to do, right? That our stuff is not ours. That, that God has blessed us in so many ways and we are to hold very loosely to our things. And even our time. 
so that we can be used by God as we give generously to glorify him. And so I would encourage you as we enter in this time of offertory uh, that you would be reflecting on how God has called you to give generously to the church, but also to those around you that you see in need. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together to worship you on this Palm Sunday. But God, part of our worship is how we give. And we are called to to, to literally give of our lives, to give of ourselves to others. And God, I pray that we would be found to be generous givers, just as you are the generous giver in giving your only son to die on the cross for our salvation. God, I pray that over these next few moments, even as we sing, we can reflect on the, on the call to live generously, to give generously. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.
Holy is the Lord Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. You believe that, church? We stand with us. We continue to praise. We cry, Hosanna to the God who saves.
praise the one who is worthy. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. The time of year we think about that word again. We think about what it means. Hosanna, we saw some 2,000 plus years ago as Jesus entered the city and the, the streets were filled. The people cried, Hosanna, Hosanna. They were crying praise. And that word in Hebrew means save us or save me. What these people were literally crying out as Jesus rode in on a donkey was save me, help me. They were desperate. They were needy. They were lost. Fast forward 2,000 years. I think those words would describe me and you. Wouldn't you agree? Desperate, needy, and lost. But the same God that they cried out to, though he came unlike they expected, though he had a temporary end that they did not expect, but King Jesus defeated sin. He defeated death, even death upon a cross. And now this morning, some 2,000 years later, we can cry out, Hosanna to he who is worthy. We cry out, God, save us. Perhaps you have cried that out before and you, you've confessed Jesus as your Lord and repented of your sins. Well, church, I've got good news. He is faithful to forgive you. But if you haven't this morning, maybe you're here. It's, it's Easter season. It's Passion Week, which we've acknowledged. And people come back to church because it's kind of what they do. But maybe you're, maybe you're crying out this morning and you don't know what you're crying out for. Well, King Jesus is there. Cry out to him and he will save you. Hosanna, God, save me. 1 John 5, 20, you see this on the screen in front of you. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know the true one. We are in the true one. That is, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. None before him, none above him. His kingdom will have no end. He is coming again as a risen and reigning king. We celebrate King Jesus. Though the nations rage, though kingdoms fall, there is one that will remain. And it's King Jesus together. We cry out, save us, mighty God.
ancient of days, we declare your praise. There's none above you, there is none before you. All of time is in your hands. You sing your son Jesus to, to come, born as a child, live a sinless life, die on a cross and satisfy the wrath of God, bearing the weight of my sin and my shame that we might cry out, Jesus, save me, Hosanna. Save me, Jesus. God, all the power and all the glory belongs to you. Not just on Palm Sunday, not just on Passion Week, but with all that we are and all that we have. We are here by your glory and for your glory. Jesus, we love you. Sister Mark comes and we open the word of God together. Spirit, would you speak? Focus our minds and hearts upon you. May we stand in all of the ancient of days, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, mighty King Jesus. It's in that name we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me see the church. The Easter season recounts the preparation of Jesus as the Passover lamb and moves from the sacrifice on the cross to the celebration of a risen Savior. What did the cross and resurrection achieve? In a word, life. Christ's saving work on our behalf is the good news of eternal life. And this good news calls each of us to faith and repentance. Christianity rests on the certainty of Jesus' resurrection. Just as Jesus said, because I live, you also will live. We all have a tendency to boast, don't we? A little bit of a nature to want to brag about something we've done, something we've accomplished, an achievement we've uh, been working toward and we finally got there. Maybe it's even a, a hobby or something that we're really obsessed and good, good with. We, we tend to want to tell other people, right? That's just kind of our, our human nature. And I know it goes back to probably our sin condition of, of pride, but we, we have a tendency to boast. And just to be transparent, I'll... I have that same tendency. I'm no different than anybody else. I'll give you a, a little example. It was about three plus years ago or so, and we were in need of a new dishwasher. So my wife and I go to the, the Lowe's or Home Depot to, to pick out a dishwasher. And we're there, and we finally found the one that we wanted, and we're placing it on order, and the guy's writing it up, and he goes, now, if you want that installed, it'll be uh, 200 and something dollars. So I look over at Macy and say, I think I can do this. <laughs> now, have I ever installed a dishwasher? Oh, absolutely not. Uh, I'm pretty scared of plumbing, but I'm thinking, $200, right? I can do this. So we eventually, it, it showed up, and much to my own credit, no, I, I actually got it installed, and it works, and it's still working to this day. And I find every opportunity I can to let people know, I installed a dishwasher. Now, see how easily that comes in to the one to share about? Now, that's a silly example a little bit, but you think about the things that you talk about in a normal course of a day. We tend to talk about things that are important to us, and usually the thing that's most important to us are things about us. And so we have to be very careful. And, and for some of you that are very competitive, Oh boy, this gets really dangerous for you because, you know, someone will share, hey, you know, I, I ran a 5K in, uh, in 18 minutes and you go, oh, I did that in third grade. <laughs> uh, or someone comes up and says, hey, I just got my knee replaced and I was able to get back going in, in eight weeks. And you go, I had both replaced at the same time and I did it in four weeks. You know, we always, there's that person that always is trying to one-up somebody, right? And even if you're not competitive, and even if you think you never boast, think about it. Do you boast about other people? What about your kids, your children, their accomplishments? You can't wait to tell people about that. And for all of you grandparents out there, you're guilty, right? I mean, you'd like to talk about your grandkids. I, I hear it a lot. Not a grandparent, but I hear it from a lot of grandparents about how wonderful their kids are. I see the pictures, you know. We like to boast. We like to brag. And our propensity to want to boast stands in stark contrast to what the Apostle Paul says to the Galatians in Galatians 6, 14. And this is not the text for today's sermon, but it's going to kick us off. Because Paul says in Galatians 6, 14, he says this, But far be it from me to boast 
except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, far be it from me to boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ. And so the object of boasting for Paul was not in what he'd accomplished, what he'd done, but boasting in the cross. And Paul understood this tendency because he was actually, in the context of 614, he's dealing with some people that are boasting in something, even something that sounds religious. And so he's correcting them in that. But he understood that we all have this tendency to talk about things that we've accomplished, things we've achieved, things that we're passionate about, things that we're obsessed with. And Paul says, whoa, whoa, whoa. None of that matters. I'm not going to boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ. So the question I'll, I'll ask as we get started is, what are you boasting in right now? What are you boasting in? Where are, are your brags coming? And maybe a better question is, when's the last time you boasted in the cross? When's the last time that you were so obsessed with what Christ has done for you that you couldn't help but boast in the cross of Jesus Christ? I guess another question is, why why the cross? Why specifically did Paul say he boasted in the cross? Well, very early on, and we read this in, in Paul's, Paul's epistles throughout the New Testament, we, we see that the cross was central to the Christian faith. Take away the cross and what Jesus did on the cross, you have no Christian faith. They understood the centrality of it. They understood the critical nature of the cross. And so from early on, it became the central part of the Christian faith. So much so that that cross, it was a form of execution, became the symbol for the Christians. And, and to think that they would use something as horrific as a form of, of execution as their symbol says a lot about how important the cross was early on to Christians. I often wonder, why, why, not, why not another symbol? Why not, why not you know, the manger? Why don't we... Uh, Use the empty tomb. You know, we could put that on our necklaces, right? Have an empty tomb. But no, it was the cross because they understood how central the message of the cross was to our Christian faith. And Paul said, I don't want to boast in anything but the cross. And so there are a lot of passages in Scripture where we could look at and, and, and learn about the cross, that, that, the, that the cross is the central message of a lot of different passages throughout the New Testament. But we're going to look at Romans chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles uh, or your device that can get you to the Scriptures, turn to Romans chapter 5. And we're going to look at just a few verses in Romans chapter 5. But we're going to see why we should boast in the cross. And the big idea for our, our message this morning, our study this morning, is this. And it answers the question, why should we boast in the cross? We boast in the cross because of God's amazing love demonstrated through his atoning work on the cross. Why should we boast in the cross? This is why. Because of God's amazing love, God's atoning work, and then at the end of our outline, we're gonna, our message, we're going to see what should our response be to God's amazing love and God's atoning work. So let's begin by looking at Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. And we'll see on the cross, we first see, Roman number 1, God's amazing love. God's amazing love. Let me go ahead and read that. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I use the phrase, God's amazing love, and I hope that over the next few minutes as we unpack these verses that you'll walk away going, yeah. I knew God's love was amazing, but I've been reminded this morning of just how amazing and fantastic his love truly is. And really, it starts with understanding, look at verse 8, because we're going we're gonna to go back to verse 6 in just a minute, but, but look at verse 8, and when he says, God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners. I think that's the key to understanding this amazing love. And we'll break it down more. Paul will break it down more for us. But you, under, you understand that for us as humans, our natural tendency is to love people that love us, right? 
It's easier to love somebody that loves you in return. It's hard. It's difficult. It's tough to love somebody that's neutral to you or even against you. That's hard. But that's exactly what God is demonstrating here, even to a much higher degree than our own human love, trying to love somebody that's against us, that might be our enemy. So first off, we see God's unconditional love. Letter A, his unconditional love. And Paul describes here in this section we're looking at, really what we, it's the opposite of what we tend to boast for, boast about. But Paul's gonna make it real clear, what is our condition outside of Jesus Christ? Outside of Jesus Christ and his saving work. The first thing we see, and by the way, someone asked me the other day, are you ever going to start putting blanks on the outline again? Does anybody remember the blanks we used to have on the outlines? Yeah. And, and they were, and they were, and I said, well, why do you want the blanks? And they said, well, it's kind of like a guessing game to guess what the word's going to be. Uh, sorry, no, no outline, no blanks today, but there's room underneath Roman numeral or letter A that you can write three phrases. And so I'm going to give you three phrases that are actually right from the text. So no blanks, but you can still, for those of you that like to have blanks, just imagine a blank there. And the first one is we are weak. We are weak. Paul says in verse six that while we were still weak, and that word could better be translated without strength or powerless, because when we think of the word weak, we often think of, you know, you know I went to the gym today and I just was a little weaker than normal. I, you know, I, I couldn't lift the, you know, the 200 pound curl that I normally do, so I had to do 190. You know, that's what we, we're just not on our full game. We're a little weak. But that's not what this word means. It means that we are without strength. It's as if you went to the gym and picked up the weight and you, could, you couldn't even pick it up. You could grab it, but you couldn't even pick it up. We are were, we were without strength. We're powerless. In fact, Paul uses this word, uh, uses the phrase in Ephesians 2.1. He says that we were dead in our transgressions or sin. And that's practically what, what it means is we have no means to achieve our own salvation. There's nothing that you and I can do to, 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 ha, to ha, have a right relationship with God on our own. It was all initiated and all comes from God. So Paul starts off saying, hey, we're weak. Number two, he tells us that we are ungodly. We were weak and we were ungodly. He says at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And that word ungodly means that the unrighteous, the unloving, that that we were at odds with God. A little bit later on in verse 10, he'll, he'll refer to us as enemies, that while we were still enemies, and that's that idea of ungodly and rebellion against God. And then the third thing we see here in verse eight is we are sinners, We are sinners while we were still sinners. And here Paul uses this word. To sin means to miss the mark, to miss God's standard, right? To be a sinner means to be in a constant state of missing the mark. Can anybody relate to that? I know for myself, I feel like oftentimes I'm in a constant state of missing the mark. I fall short. In fact, that's what Paul says in Romans 3, 23. For all fall short of the glory of God. For all are sin, have all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's, that's, That's our state outside of Christ. And even once we come to know him, we still struggle with the sin nature. But Paul's building this picture here of just how undeserving you and I are of God's love. And when we think about how undeserving we are, it's that that backdrop to know that I am a sinner, that I am weak, I'm ungodly, I'm unrighteous, I'm a sinner. All of those things are true. And yet, God still loves me. How could God love a sinner like me? How? I mean, think about how hard it is to love somebody that constantly disappoints you, upsets you, makes you mad, makes you angry, and how often you want to just give up, but yet God never gives up. And he loves an undeserving sinner like me, and he'll love an undeserving sinner like you. Amen? That's the good news. That amazing love that he has for us, even when we're unloving. And, the, and the, the application for us is that we are called to love that same way to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Back in John chapter 13, we looked at this a few weeks ago. Jesus says, a new command I give you, to love what? One another. To love one another, just as I have loved you. Meaning, hey, in just a little while, you're going to see what that love costs me. And yet Jesus God, the love that he has for us as undeserving sinners, that's unconditional love. And that's the kind of love that we're to have for one another. Letter B, we also see his sacrificial love. It's unconditional, but it's also sacrificial. In verse eight, God shows his love for us that in, 
that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. That's the sacrificial nature of God's love for sinners. And it's best seen in Jesus, his son, on the cross. That's a sacrifice. We, we like to talk about sacrifices we make. You know, we say, well, I'm going to make a sacrifice, and instead of getting the name brand, I'll get the generic today. Or I'm going to make a sacrifice, you know, and, you know, and you know, I'll, I'll cut back, and I won't spend as much money, you know, this week on my favorite hobby or my favorite entertainment. Or I'm going to, I'm going to give up some time here to, to do this or to serve here. And, and we, we are making sacrifices, but those to use the word sacrifice sometimes compared to what God sacrificed. It's almost hard to use the same word, isn't it? To consider that God, in his love, sent his one and only son into this world to die for our sins. That's a sacrifice. That's a costly sacrifice in that it cost him the death of his son. It's a rare sacrifice in that he gave his only son. It's an expensive sacrifice in that it cost the, sh the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ. In this way, the cross is such a powerful demonstration of God's love for you. And I, I can't help, when I, when I slow down enough and just meditate on the unconditional nature of God's love for me and the sacrificial nature of God's love for me, I get overwhelmed. How could he love me like that? How could he? And I pray this morning that you leave here with a deeper, maybe not a deeper understanding, but a deeper reminder today of just how much God's love truly is amazing. And that same love, that unconditional sacrificial love, calls me to love you unconditionally and love you unconditionally and love you sacrificially and to go out of my way to sacrifice for you. And so once again, I find myself falling short of the mark because I struggle loving like God loves me. But yet Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. That's the challenge for all of us. On the, the video we watched earlier with Pastor Russell, we saw those four measures at the end. And I know they went by fast, but the last one says this. Love sacrificially. Love sacrificially. We've used the definition around here for agape love, that kind of love for one another, that it is the unconditional, self-sacrificial commitment for the well-being of another person. Wouldn't it be awesome if McGregor Baptist Church, every single one of us, we're more concerned with loving unconditionally and sacrificially the people in the body of Christ here. What would that look like for all of us? Can you imagine the love that you would receive as you were giving that love? And that's God's plan for his church that we would learn to love as he loved us. I'm gonna take a quick little break here. Intermission? No, not really. But I want to, uh, want to encourage you to, to do a couple of things. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, this is Passion Week, and we have a podcast that comes out every Tuesday that's called Beyond the Notes. And I know some of you look forward to listening to that. That podcast is designed around things that we weren't able to cover on Sunday morning that we'll share, or maybe go a little deeper on a particular topic. And for those that want to hear that, can go. Well, I have a chance to do the Beyond the Notes podcast this week, and instead of doing what we normally do, I'm going to be sharing some, some things, some ideas, some resources that will encourage you to prepare for Easter Sunday. Because I don't know about you, but it's a busy world that we live in, and there's so many things going on, and I don't want to show up on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, and yeah, it'll be great if I show up. If you just are here, awesome. But I want to prepare my heart for that. And that's part of the reason why I'm teaching this passage this morning. That's why we're having that concert this afternoon, this evening at 5 o'clock, uh, evening of, of praise. And I'll share some other ideas on things we can do to prepare for that. I put a couple of resources. If you're not able to join me on the podcast, a couple of resources. I know it's kind of hard to order a book and get it before Easter, but that first one, Journey to the Cross by Paul David Tripp, is an excellent resource. It's my second time going through it. It's more of a devotional type book, and I highly recommend it. Even if you don't, aren't able to do the 40 days leading up to Easter, you could do it at another time. And then the other one, The Heart of the Cross, is a, a new book to me. I don't know how long it's actually been out, but it has also been... I've got a lot out of it during my devotional time and really focusing in on that unconditional sacrificial love that God displayed through his son Jesus Christ on the cross. All right, back to our outline, Roman numeral two. 
We've looked at God's amazing love. Now we're going to look at God's atoning work. And let's read verses 9 through, uh, 9 through 11. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So because of God's amazing love demonstrated on the cross, we can experience this atoning work and salvation. Now we use that word atonement a lot. What do we mean? Let's let's do a quick little definition, and it's a pretty simple one. But atonement is Christ's death on the cross Christ's death on the cross as a substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. Christ's death on the cross as a substitutionary sacrifice for our sin. For our sins. That's what atonement is. That's Jesus bearing the wrath of God the Father in our place. That's Jesus on the cross paying the penalty for our sins that we could never pay. That's what we mean when we talk about the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And Paul helps us understand atonement by using two different terms. And he's going to run these two terms in this passage I just read in parallel because they go together. And the two words are justify and reconcile. And the word justify is the, more the judicial word. We're in the courtroom when, we, when Paul uses that. And the word reconcile is the relational word. It's the word that we would use in our relationships, in our home, with friends. And so he's using these two words to draw a picture, to explain what happens when we first come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So let's start with letter A. We are justified. He says, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood. Justification is really good news, by the way. Justification is great news. Because remember our condition apart from Christ, that we were weak, ungodly, unrighteous, sinners, missing the mark, all of those things. That was our condition before we are justified. But in the moment of our justification, our position radically changes at that moment. It's a radical change. And this is a change that we should get excited about every time we think about this change. Because the word justify means to declare not guilty. But it also, Paul has the connotation here that it means to be declared righteous at the same time. That we are declared not guilty. Remember, prior to Christ, we are guilty. Our sins cause us to be guilty before a holy God. But in our justification, when we repent and turn from our sin and put our faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone, we move at that point from being guilty to not guilty, from being unrighteous to being righteous. We now have the righteousness of Christ. And I know that you have probably heard this before, but just like his love should just blow our minds at how amazing it is, this act of justification from moving from guilty and unrighteous to not guilty and righteous before a holy God should cause you to shout hallelujah. Got a few hallelujahs. I know you can think, well, he's, he's talking a bunch of theology up there. Yes, I am, because it's important theology, because this is, this is so important. And the more we understand it of what, was, what the atoning work that Jesus was doing on the cross, the more we can celebrate next Sunday at the resurrection. Because we know that the price, the penalty for our sins has been paid in full by the blood, the shed blood, of Jesus Christ. In fact, that's the means we see here. It says we're justified by his blood. And this goes against every fiber in our being because we as human beings want to do something to justify ourselves, don't we? In fact, most world religions are all built around a system of self-justification, of self-righteousness, of things. If you do this, this, and this, then you will achieve this. But the Christian faith is very different. The Christian faith says, you don't do anything. You are justified by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way. That's the means by which we are saved. Declared not guilty. Declared 
righteous by his blood. It's only by the blood of Jesus Christ that we are made right before God. There's a song we're going to sing tonight as part of our, our worship night. And it's called No Other Fount. And the words of this song point to the justifying work of Jesus' blood that was shed on the cross. And I want to read just a few words from the lyrics of this, uh, this song. Hopefully this will encourage you to want to be back here tonight. Nothing can for sin atone. Hope is found in you alone. Sin and death are overcome only by your precious blood. Only your blood has the power. There is no other, no other fount I know. Jesus, your love made a way. No other fount I know can save. Paul doesn't stop there with it. He's super excited that we're gone from guilty to not guilty to unrighteous to righteous. But he says, but wait, there's more. The last part of verse 90 says, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And this is Paul using the argument from the greater to the lesser, meaning if God can justify us, if he can change our position before him, then how much more can he save us from the coming wrath of God? And by the way, our condition outside of Christ, for every sinner guilty before a holy God, one day that judgment and wrath is coming meaning that they will spend eternity separated from God in hell for eternity. That's what every sinner deserves. That's what every single one of us deserves outside of Jesus Christ. But here he says, but wait, not only are you justified, you will also be spared that coming judgment and wrath that's coming on every sinner. Letter B, not only are we justified, that's the judicial term, but we also, we are reconciled. Verse 10 says this, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. To reconcile means to restore relationship, to restore relationship. And in, in Christ, in his shed blood, we have been reconciled with God. There is peace now between us and the creator God. And it flows out of our justification. The moment that we went from being guilty and unrighteous to not guilty and righteous, we also restored the broken relationship between us and God, that we now have peace with God. And when you think about it on a human standpoint, there's nothing sweeter than a restored relationship that's been broken over time, right? To have that relationship brought back together. Imagine the preciousness of our relationship as we have confessed Christ as our Lord and Savior, been moved from being justified from guilty to not guilty, and now having peace with the Creator, God, in relationship, a personal relationship with him. So justification, our legal standing, reconciliation, the personal relationship. And so the judge has pronounced us as righteous and the father has called us home. Amen. Our response. How do we respond? How do we respond? Verse 11, I think Paul tells us how we should respond. He says, more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So what is your response to God's amazing love? Well, I think this brings us back to the big idea. Because the big idea that we started with says that we boast, we brag, we glory in the cross because of what God has done for us. But you say, well, Mark, I don't see the word boast in our passage here. That's the cool part. Because look at verse 11. When Paul says more than that, we also rejoice. That word rejoice in the Greek language is the exact same word that Paul used in Galatians 6, 14 when he says, except for the cross, I boast in nothing. The exact same word because that word is such a deep, rich word in the Greek language. It has these multitudes of meaning and connotation to boast, to glory, to live for, to be obsessed in. And that's what Paul's saying here, that we should, we should rejoice, we should boast, we should be obsessed in what God has done for us through his amazing love and his atoning work on the cross for us. So is that your response this morning? Is that going to be your response this Passion Week? That you just can't wait to boast in what God has done for you through his son Jesus Christ on the cross? Perhaps you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Christ. And maybe all this doesn't make a whole lot of sense talking about boasting in a cross. I would encourage you Consider your own condition, your own sin condition. We all are born into that sin condition. And there's absolutely nothing we can do to 
achieve, to earn favor with God, to, to do something to have eternal life, salvation. But it's only through what God has done for us through his son, Jesus Christ. And that would be my prayer for you, is that you would consider just how much God loves you, that amazing love that he demonstrated on the cross. You would recognize your sin and that you would repent and turn from that sin and turn toward Christ in faith, trusting what he has done for you on the cross. And for those of you that are in Christ this morning, this is a great time to be reminded of all the things that we are thankful for, but ultimately that we are thankful for the sacrifice that God made through his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. That this would be, even this morning, that we would spend a little time in our response song that we'll sing in just a moment, reflecting on just how grateful we are for God's love. In fact, I'll be honest, I have a hard time not reflecting for more than a few seconds and feeling a sense of overwhelm, overwhelmness and emotion of how much God truly does love me and how he demonstrated that through his son, Jesus Christ. The song we're gonna sing is entitled, Jesus, Thank You. And I wanna read the words of the chorus because it is such a beautiful song that talks about what we've been talking about here this morning. And the chorus goes like this. Your blood has washed away my sins. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. Let's pray. God, I am, I am overwhelmed <laughs> that you would love a sinner like me in the way that you did through your son, Jesus Christ. I, I know how undeserving I am. I know my own shortcomings. I know my own mind. And there was nothing in me that was worthy of you. There was nothing in me that deserved your grace, your mercy. There was nothing in me that merited what you did for me through your son, Jesus, on the cross. And all I can say is, Jesus, thank you. And I pray that my response is to learn how to brag a whole lot more about Jesus and a whole lot less about me. And when someone's around me, they hear a whole lot more about Jesus and the cross than they do about me or what I think is important. God, I pray that would be the challenge for all of us, that we would live just as Paul lived, boasting in nothing but the cross of Jesus Christ. And God, I pray for these next few moments as we sing, this can truly be a time of reflecting and potentially responding to the call to turn from our sins and put our faith and trust in Christ and him alone for our salvation. And it's in Christ's name I pray, amen. You stand as we respond in truth. We thank Jesus for the cross.
seated at your table. Aren't you thankful to King Jesus for that truth this morning, church? Amen. Praise Jesus. As you leave, just a few things. Don't forget to grab those Easter invite cards one week from today, Resurrection Sunday. Invite your friends, invite your coworkers, pass those cards out until they're gone. Come back here and pick up some more. Uh, don't forget tonight, 5 o'clock, worship night. You don't want to miss it. Thursday night, 6.30, upper room service. Look forward to seeing you and worshiping with you at those services. God bless. Happy Palm Sunday. Finally, good news. The Easter season speaks of the most hope-filled thing that has ever happened. The good news of Jesus' resurrection is a saving hope that we all need. There's no place like McGregor Baptist Church to celebrate Easter Sunday in worship and Bible study this Easter season. And we can't wait to meet you at one of our in-person services. Our McGregor Church family is here for you and your family. So join us on Sunday, April 17th at one of our worship services at 8, 9.30 or 11 a.m. We hope to see you there. One of the deepest mysteries of the Christian faith is the triune or Trinitarian nature of God. Uh, and there's something very, very special to be seen in the relationship between God the Son and God the Spirit and the believer. And we're gonna talk about that today on Beyond the Notes. I'm Pastor Russell Howard, and I'm really, really glad you're with us today. The, uh, the Trinity is, is a difficult and mysterious concept. It just is. One of the things that is, is said of the Trinity, and, and I believe it's, it's a correct statement, of course it's a correct statement, is that there's the, the fact of the Trinity, that God is, is one personality that expresses himself in three persons, is, is what's called an irreducible fact. It's, it's 
the universe's central irreducible fact that the God who is is a triune God. What that means is he, he defies metaphor. You can't say the Trinity is like this or that or the other, because there are all kinds of, of heresy you get into very, very quickly when you try to force a mold onto the Trinity. There is one God. We do not worship three gods. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are all God. Not in the sense that all three of them are equally God, but in the sense that they are all the same one God. And if that makes your head feel like it's going to you know, slightly stretch to the point of exploding, you're probably seeing it correctly. It's, a, it's an interesting concept. And as we looked at the passage this week on Sunday morning, this back half of John 14, where Jesus promises the coming Holy Spirit, it, it led me to want to peer more deeply into something for a moment that I thought would be a really, really good place to take this week's Beyond the Notes. Let me, let me pose a question. The question is, where is Jesus right now? Where is Jesus right now? You know, Easter is coming up in just a little while. And one of the most important, distinctive truths we, we guard and express, the Bible is clear about it, that the, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a physical resurrection. That the body that went into that grave on Friday came out of that grave on Sunday, albeit glorified, a very different form and a very sort of the eternal glorified version of that body. But, but 1 Corinthians 15, for example, makes it clear that what happened to Jesus on Easter Sunday as he walked out of his grave physically is the basis and the model for the physical resurrection of all believers. This is not a, a spiritual event. What came out of the grave was not some, you know, Jesus, the, the ghost. It was Jesus, the man, Jesus Christ. And the, the one that spent those, those days with his disciples, those 40 days after the resurrection, was the physically embodied man, Jesus Christ. He, he demonstrated some supernatural capabilities. He could travel very, very quickly. Uh, he could literally walk through walls, but he was not a spirit being. He was a physically embodied uh, John 21. He sits on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and eats some fish with the guys. So this is an embodied, physical, resurrected, eternally durable body like you and I will one day have in the resurrection. So, and, and that is the Jesus that ascended in Acts chapter 1 when he, when he, flew up into the clouds at, um, on the side of the Mount of Olives there facing Jerusalem. So we, we must guard the physical resurrection of Jesus and the physical reality of what 1 Timothy 2.5 calls our intercessor, the man, Jesus Christ. In his present form, he is a man. Well, where, where is he? Well, we don't have to wonder about that. Now, set aside for a moment what you know about the fundamental omnipresence of God. And hang on, because this is an Easter truth that is to be preserved. Hang on to your understanding that Jesus Christ is a resurrected human being at this moment. At this moment, in the spring of 2022, Jesus is a resurrected human being. And Ephesians 1.20, Colossians 3.1, Hebrews 8.1, and Hebrews 12.2 all unite in telling us that, that that resurrected Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father in the throne room of the universe with God the Father. One time, by the way, as a fun footnote, he is depicted as standing beside the throne of God the Father, and that is when he welcomes the first martyr, Stephen. The first person aside from Jesus himself to die for his Christian faith is the martyr Stephen. And in Acts 7.55, Stephen, about to die, says that I see the heavens opened and, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father. It's the only time in the uh, post-ascension appearances of Jesus in heaven that he's said to be not seated to the right hand of the Father, but standing in honor of Stephen who gave his life for his faith. That's a bit of Bible trivia. But here's what I want you to get. I want you to get that Jesus Christ, physically resurrected, physically alive as a resurrected human being, is positioned in a particular place at the right hand of the throne of God. 
but I, I, I thought Jesus was with me. And you're not, you're not wrong to say that he is. I think of a couple of passages. Matthew 18, 20 is the promise. In a, it's in a context of a, of a congregation gathered to deal with the difficult matter of church discipline, actually. But the statement Jesus makes in Matthew 18, 20 is, if two or three of you gather in my name, there am I in the midst of you. Well, I have, uh, I've been around Christians for a long, long time, and I have been in more than I can count gatherings of more than two or three people gathered in Jesus' name. And the resurrected Christ, the man, Jesus Christ, who typically is seated at the right hand of the Father, hasn't shown up for any of those meetings. God the Son has not been there. And I'm not saying that Jesus got it wrong. Bear with me and don't write me hateful emails. I'm just saying the embodied, resurrected, physical man, Jesus Christ, I've never been in the room with him yet. Yet. In the Great Commission, at the end of the, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 28, 20, he makes a similar statement. He says, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, now, if he's a physically embodied, resurrected man, and he is, while he is still God the Son. And he is typically seated at the right hand of his Father in heaven, which, again, four times in the New Testament, he's said to be seated there, one time standing, but always at the right hand of God the Father. How is he always with me? Because he said he would be. Well, because the, the, the Trinitarian God, the triune God, is, in fact, one God. When he says, I, God the Father can say, I, and that I include God the Spirit and God the Son. God the Son can say, I, and mean God the Father and God the Spirit. God the Spirit can say, I, and include God the Son and God the Father. John fourteen twenty, part of the passage that we dealt with on a recent Sunday morning at McGregor, Jesus is talking to his disciples in the context of promising them the Spirit. And he says, in that day, that is the day that he comes to them in the form of the Spirit, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. The I in John fourteen twenty out of the mouth of Jesus is a reference to God the Holy Spirit. So God the Holy Spirit allows us the the incredibly privileged position of all time, that is at all times, intimate, connected relationship, access to the living God. In fact, possession by the living God in the literal spirit possession sense. While at the same time, preserving the important and unique truth of the physical, literal Resurrection, ascension, and one day return of Jesus Christ. We can have it both ways because the God who is has chosen to reveal himself to us as God the Son and God the Spirit at the same time. So we have all the amazing truth of a literal resurrection and a literally ascended Christ. We have a literal man, Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of God the Father, standing in for us and interceding on our behalf. And at the same time, we have the spiritual presence of God, the Holy Spirit in our heart. And while they are different persons of the Trinity, they're the same God. Um, years ago on Easter Sunday, we used to sometimes make the statement that Jesus is not dead and in this tomb are dead and in the tomb, he's alive and in this room. And that used to bug me a little bit because I thought, no, because the Jesus that resurrected is not in this room because he's a man standing at the, or seated at the right hand of God the Father. God the Holy Spirit is in this room. And I was probably being a precise to the point of pickiness, but it's really, really important to guard the truth of the literal physical resurrection of Christ while at the same time guarding the truth of the intimate connected possession of the living God in the person of the Holy Spirit. And we can guard those both if we understand the Trinity correctly. 
Well, that was just something to think about. I pray that by now you have, you have subscribed or liked this podcast. I hope you're sharing it with your friends. And if so, I'm glad. God bless you. And we look forward to the next time we're here, here together on Beyond the Notes. What does God think about the unborn? Is there a biblical case for abortion? And if so, how does it line up with science? Welcome to Talk Truth, a McGregor podcast where we dive into scripture, gain insight from community, and biblically answer life questions. Talk Truth will answer life questions submitted by our listeners every other week. If you have a question for Talk Truth, you can submit your questions on our website. I'm your host, Chloe Weimer. Let's open the word, gather together, and talk some truth. I am joined by my good friend, Jamie Holmes, a wife and mother of two and an RN. Also joining me is my friend and co-worker, Mr. David Asfor, who is a husband, a father, and science teacher. David, what do you teach again? Biology, marine biology, anatomy, and aquaculture. Okay. And what is your education in? Uh, bachelor's degree in biology, and I went to grad school for marine biology. Gotcha. Okay. So this is a very diverse group of people, I would say, but, um, I think that with both of your backgrounds and your education, we're going to be able to talk about abortion, um, with like a well-rounded perspective. Quite honestly, I am not a science gal and I'm going to be real honest about that. Um, but I think that that's okay because I'm learning from you guys. So I'm probably going to be sitting over here and just like nodding and being like, wow, yeah, <laughs> in agreement. <laughs> Um, But we are going to be talking today about the science behind abortion, which will resonate with a lot of people in a personal sense. And when Talk Truth speaks on real life issues like this, we want to do exactly what the name says. We want to talk truth, but we want to talk truth in love and we want to defend our faith with gentleness and respect. Like we've talked about in previous episodes about defending our faith and people listening to this may feel, um, I just want to make it like clear, even just with us, like they're, they're going to be experiencing a lot of emotions, especially if they have had an abortion or if they have a close friend or a family member who has. And so we just want to be mindful of the way that we approach the topic. Um, and keep that in mind. Um, but also if you are listening to this, know that we aren't going to be talking about this in the sense that we are approaching the question the way that our opinions are, are, are approaching the question. It's, it's how does, how would God respond to abortion? And, and the way that we know that is because he has made it extremely clear in his word. He's also made it, I mean, he, he reveals himself in two ways, both in creation, but also in the word. And if you want to hear God speak, open your Bible and and read it. And if you want to hear his audible voice, you can read your Bible out loud and hear his voice too. So that's what we're um, going to be talking about. And I want to keep that in mind. Um, But also know if, if you are listening to this, make sure you hold on to the end because we are going to talk about how God, um, can and will redeem it. These, these, this conversation, it's going to be, we're going to be in some deep waters and treading through some things that are difficult. Um, but God has a way of, I mean, he, he meets us in the water, comes down, comes down in it with us by sending his son to die on the cross. And he picks us up when we didn't even know that we were drowning and brings us on solid ground. And he, he provides redemption for our sins and our guilt and our shame. And every, all, all of us sitting at this table have experienced that. And, um, I just, if you're listening to this, I hope that you, you hold on if, if this makes you uncomfortable, because know that Jesus does redeem it. So all that to be said, um, I'm going to pray and we're just going to dive right in. All right. So let's go to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for, um, just meeting us in, um, our, our drowning and bringing us to solid ground. And I just ask that you give us wisdom as we talk about a, a really touchy subject and you help us to, um, just speak truth, but speak truth in love. In Jesus' name, amen. 
All right. So here on Talk Truth, we like to start with definitions. And I looked up what abortion is. And the first thing that came up was the Oxford Dictionary definition, and it is the deliberate termination of a human pregnancy, most often performed during the first 28 weeks of pregnancy. And so the whole reason this episode came about was because um, David and I were working a couple weeks ago and somehow we got started about what you were teaching in class and I think it was on gender and we started talking about like the semantics of gender and sexuality and how that word has been morphed by our culture and people have just you know so can you just talk about like the semantics with abortion and even words like embryo fetus baby and even even murder if if you want to go ahead and talk about that yeah with with most of those terms uh starting with uh zygote really that's one you didn't throw in there it's Ooh. a new one for you but uh that's basically when uh, a sperm and an egg fuse uh, at that moment or you know minutes or hours later it's a zygote then you have embryo then you have fetus then you have newborn and something to remember about embryo and fetus, those are the two most commonly used terms in, in abortion. Those are just stages. Mm -hmm. We can't get hung up on the name and say that well, because it's a different name, it's something different than what we are. Um, it's no different than when you, after birth, it's baby, infant, um, toddler, child. I mean, we have names for every stage of life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, young adult, middle age, whatever you want to call it. So embryo and fetus are the same thing. So, and, and this is actually part of the debate is, is an embryo and is an embryo, not a person yeah. is a fetus, not a person. Um, and so embryo is, uh, what is it? I'm thinking nine weeks. Happy Palm Sunday, church family. My name is Kim, and I want to welcome you to Sunday morning worship here at McGregor Baptist Church. If you are wanting to find out what's going on around McGregor, you can pick up one of our Around McGregor handouts here on campus, or if you're watching online, just head over to mcgregor.net slash around. There you can find upcoming things like VBS. We're gonna be celebrating God's greatness in our monumental VBS, June 13th through 17th. VBS is for three years to fifth grade, and the fun begins each night at 6.15 p.m. and wraps up at 8.15 p.m. The kids will be learning about the greatness of God from the Bible, having hands-on fun with the Imagination Station, and learning new songs each night. So moms, dads, and grandparents, don't wait. Pre-registration for your kids and grandkids is open now. Just go to mcgregor.net slash VBS. Also, we want to invite you to join us for a night of worship tonight as we worship together through singing, reading scripture, and praying as we praise Jesus for giving his life and prepare our hearts for corporate worship on Resurrection Sunday. No matter if you are new or have been with us before, you can connect with us wherever you are. You can like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram or find a connect card in the pew rack. Let's get ready and let's worship Jesus Christ together. and happy Palm Sunday to you. Are you glad to be here today? We're glad you're here today. Will you stand with us? We praise this King of glory. Psalm 24, who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is. 
the King of glory, one who is strong to save, one who is mighty. We declare his praise this morning. church Jesus the king of glory all creatures of our God and king lift up his praise praise the one true God Hosanna king of kings eternal God
God. Amen. You can have a seat. The church was and is not our idea. And by extension, this church, McGregor Baptist, well, it's not our creation. The church was conceived in the mind of Jesus Christ for, for his purposes. The purpose of the church, therefore, is, is always the same. It's the making of disciples for the glory of God. The elders of our church realize that we, we, we dare not construct a purpose for our church, but we can seek to articulate a purpose. The purpose we've articulated is this, by God's grace, we desire to glorify God by magnifying His Word to make disciples who think biblically, live missionally, give generously, and love sacrificially. The statement captures the mission of our church. Operating as in all things by the grace of God, we desire to glorify God. That's the heart of our purpose because, well, that's the heart of everything's purpose. Everything in God's creation ultimately exists to bring Him glory. The means whereby we bring Him glory is the making of disciples. And the principal tool that He's given us to make disciples is the Bible, His Holy Word. Thus, by His grace, we desire to glorify God by magnifying His Word to develop disciples. While we believe that the mission of the church and the means, God's Word, that we use to reach that mission are the same for every gospel-centered church. They're tied to the heart of God for the church. The measures each church employs can be, well, a bit unique. Different churches can and will employ different measures to accomplish our Lord's mission. Here at McGregor, we've, we've settled on four measures that we believe define the, the mission of discipleship for our church. The first of those measures is that we think biblically. The Bible should be our, our guide, our standard, our textbook. It's a love letter from God to His people, wherein He's told us everything we need to know to live out the life of a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. In fact, everything we can claim to know with certainty about God is contained in His written Word, the Bible. Therefore, it should always guide our thoughts, our attitudes, and our actions. To live missionally certainly includes sharing our faith locally in our day-to-day -day lives and globally as part of the worldwide mission of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it's more than that. To live missionally is to live your life, not mostly as a citizen of this world, but mostly as an ambassador representing our King to this world. Giving generously affects far more than just how we spend our money. It's, it's how we devote our, our time, our attention, and, and yes, our resources to things beyond our own agenda. It's, a, it's an intentional life of devotion to the needs of others. By itself, to love sacrificially, well, could be redundant because love understood biblically is always sacrificial. But we wanna emphasize the intent to love in a sacrificial way. Love costs, but that's how Jesus has loved us. For the next several months, the ministries of McGregor will be working on incorporating this statement into their, their goals and strategy. And if you want to learn more about how the statement came to be, I'll be joining host Mark Bricker on an upcoming special episode of the Here at Home podcast. Meanwhile, please be in prayer for the elders and other leaders in the church as we seek to live out the purpose to which we believe the Lord has led us. God bless you. Good morning and welcome to worship on Palm Sunday at McGregor. And we want to welcome those of you that are joining us online as well. 
Grateful that you're here this morning. If you are a guest, a little extra special welcome goes out to you. We're so glad you're worshiping with us this morning. If you are a guest and you would like to get a little more information about our church, maybe you've been coming a while and you'd like to know about a particular ministry or maybe how to, how to join this church or whatever question you might have, there's a connect card in front of you in the pew rack and you can just take that card, fill that out and request any kind of information and we'll be back in touch with you. And you can put that card as you leave at any of the offering drop boxes on your way out there at all, pretty much every exit you can't get by, get out without seeing one of those black boxes to put that connect card. And speaking of cards, we also have a whole bunch of Easter invite cards in the foyer. Maybe you picked up some last week, maybe you picked up some on your way in. If you haven't yet, I would encourage you to take some on your way out today and be intentional. Be intentional inviting a, a, a family member, a friend, a coworker, maybe a neighbor that you know doesn't have a church home and take that card and invite them. Say, hey, why don't you come to Easter service with us next Sunday? And those are out there. Take as many as you want. If we run out, we'll print more. We'll make sure there's plenty of cards to go around that we can invite folks to come and join with us as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When I welcomed you uh, for Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday marks the beginning of Passion Week. And for us as a church, that means a few different things this week. First of all, you'll notice pretty soon that we're taking a, a break from our study in the Gospel of John for this Sunday and for next Sunday. Just those two weeks, then we'll be right back into the Gospel of John. Also, as was mentioned earlier, we have a worship night tonight at five o'clock right here. The purpose of that worship night is to help you prepare your heart for Resurrection Sunday. Also, the week's a little bit different with our schedule. Instead of coming back on Wednesday night, we have what we call an upper room service this Thursday night at 630, again, right here in this room. And I would encourage you to be a part of that upper room service. We'll celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Uh, we'll also have time to reflect and and, uh, and be preparing our hearts again for Resurrection Sunday. So tonight, five o'clock, Thursday night, upper room service, no activities on Wednesday night. Oh, so that's our Passion Week schedule. And boy, are we looking forward to Easter Sunday as always. The video that we showed right before I came up with Pastor Russell, I'm super excited about this, this purpose statement that's coming out of our elders uh, and the opportunity for us as a church to perhaps have that focus on what God is calling us to do, those unique measures. But you notice the third one that he mentioned on that list. I know they went fast, and I don't expect there's not a test later that you're going to remember all four of those measures. But the third one was give generously. And every time we gather together, we have an opportunity to give. And we call this our offertory song that we're going to sing in just a moment. But it's a lot more than just giving to the church, and that's part of it. But we need to see ourselves as generous givers. I was blessed this past week to see a brother here in our church give very generously to another brother that was in need. And that just blessed me to see that. And isn't that the way the body of Christ is supposed to be? Where we're, we're, we're thinking about others, maybe a whole lot more than we're thinking about ourselves. And so as we enter into this time of what we call our offertory song, maybe you'll reflect on your own generosity. Maybe give yourself a rating. How am I doing right now? And maybe God will begin to challenge you to give perhaps more generously than you have in the past. Let's pray. God, thank you so much again for the opportunity for us to gather together on Palm Sunday. And as we have gathered to, to worship a risen Savior, as we've gathered to study the truth of your word, as we've gathered also to encourage one another within the body of Christ. God, I pray that, that everything we do in this service, the rest of the day will be a, 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 a time of honor and glory for you. As we said earlier, that really our purpose is to bring glory to you, and that's our heart's desire. So God, we pray that you would use this time, that you would be lifted up high and glorified. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, would you stand with us as we continue to worship God through singing?
Hosanna in the highest. But this time of year, we sing that word together. We sing the word Hosanna. Sometimes you might wonder what it means. Well, Hosanna is a cry of praise. Some 2,000 plus years ago, as Christ entered the city, this triumphal entry, and they shouted Hosanna. Another meaning the Hebrew shows us is that it literally means save me or save us. So as we sing that word Hosanna, as we think of those folks that, that saw Christ enter, waving palm branches, celebrating the Messiah had come, what they were literally shouting was, Lord, save me. Save me from my depravity, from my need. I am not enough. I cannot make it on my own. And here we are 2,000 plus years later and those things are still true. I'm still in need. I'm still fallen. I still cannot make it on my own. I cannot spend eternity with Jesus apart from the saving grace through faith that has afforded me on the cross. So we sing, when we shout Hosanna, we're saying, save us. Perhaps this morning you've never done that. You've never confessed your need. You've never repented of your sins and believed that Jesus is the Son of God who came and gave his life willingly. Maybe today you need to get that settled. Perhaps you've done that, but you still find yourself grasping at straws. You still find yourself looking to things to bring satisfaction that, in the end, we know won't. But we do it. I do it. We see this in God's word, 1 John 5, 20. We'll see it on the screen. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know the true one. We are in the true one that is in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. He is the true God. He is eternal life. There is one name which we can cry out, save me, and it means something, and it's Jesus. There is one kingdom that will not ever fall, and it's the kingdom of Jesus. There is one who can always satisfy your needs, and it's Jesus. None above him, none before him, no one even comparable, for our God is the Ancient of Days, worthy of our worship, worthy of us crying out, save me. We sing together to the Ancient of Days, praise the one who is eternally worthy.
none before you. There's none above you. All the power and all the glory. God, I will trust in your name. We cry, Hosanna, Lord, save us. You alone are worthy of all praise. We exist by your grace. We exist for your glory. We gather this morning in your name. We pray in your name. We speak of your name. We sing of your name. God, may we fall in praise before the matchless name of Jesus. May we stand in all of the ancient of days. One who gave his all willingly on a cross for my sin and my shame. King Jesus, we praise you for you are beyond compare. As Pastor Mark comes, Lord, move, Spirit, speak through your word. As we worship you now through the proclamation of your inerrant and holy word. We love you, King Jesus. We pray in your mighty name. Amen. You can have a seat, church. The Easter season recounts the preparation of Jesus as the Passover lamb and moves from the sacrifice on the cross to the celebration of a risen Savior. What did the cross and resurrection achieve? In a word, life. Christ's saving work on our behalf is the good news of eternal life. And this good news calls each of us to faith and repentance. Christianity rests on the certainty of Jesus' resurrection. Just as Jesus said, because I live, you also will live. We all have a tendency to boast a little bit, don't we? I mean, if we're honest, we all have a little bit of that uh, need or desire for someone to know what I have accomplished, what I have achieved, what I have been able to do on my own. And I have to be honest, I have that same tendency as well. I'm, I, I want to be transparent. I, I can struggle with you know, wanting people to know what I have done. I'll give you a little, little example. It was about a little over three years ago, and we needed a new dishwasher. Our dishwasher was, I think, about 20 years old at the time, and we just needed a new one, time to get a new one. So we went to Lowe's or Home Depot, one of those, and we had figured out kind of which one we wanted, and we were talking with the salesperson and kind of wrapping up the deal, and, and the salesperson says, well, would you like us to install that for you? I'm like thinking, yeah, of course. How much would that be? It's 200 and something dollars. I don't remember the exact amount. And I looked over at my wife and I said, Macy, I think I can do this. <laughs> Had I ever installed a dishwasher before? Absolutely not. Uh, plum plumbing kind of scares me. I'm not the handy, handy person, you know, at all. That's like not my gift. I don't go around fixing things in the house or building things. That's not me. But $200 is a lot of money. And I'm like, I think I can do this. Me and Google and YouTube, we can figure it out. Well, it showed up, you know, several weeks later, and I'll have to say, I installed that dishwasher. And it's still working today. Yes, uh-huh. And I'm still bragging about it. <laughs> you see how easy it is to fall into that trap of boasting? And, and if you're competitive, you really have to watch out, right? Because, you know, somebody will just share what they've done, and you've got to one-up them, you know? Have you ever been around the one-upper? You know, you, you, know you, they, you say, well, I, I ran a, a 5K race in 18 minutes. And they'll say, well, I did 18 minutes in uh, third grade. You know, they, they one-up you. Or maybe you just had a knee replaced and you said, man, I just had it replaced and eight weeks later, I'm, I'm doing great. And the person goes, well, I had both replaced and in four weeks, I was up and running. You know, it's that, that competitive, I want to outdo you. Now, some of you are saying, no, I'm not a, I'm not a boaster. I'm not, I don't have a competitive bone in my body. I'm not like that. Well, think about it. If you are a parent, I have a feeling you have some pride in your children, right? You tend to boast in that. And for those of you that are grandparents out there, don't tell me you don't boast about your grandkids. I hear it all the time. I see the pictures all the time. I know you like to talk about your grandkids. We all have that propensity to boast. And I think it's that, I know it comes from our sin nature and that desire, that, that pride that comes up. But Paul says something in Galatians that deals specifically with this. And this is not our main passage we're going to look at. We're going to be in Romans chapter 5 today. But in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul says this. But far be it from me to boast 
except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul's dealing with some boasters in the, in the church, and they're boasting even in religious things. But Paul says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not going to boast about anything except, and what's his exception? His exception is the cross. I'll boast in the cross. I'll glory in the cross. I will boast about what Christ has done for me. And so the question I would ask this morning is, what are you boasting about? What are you boasting about? Or better yet, when's the last time you boasted in the cross? When's the last time that, that you were so excited about what Jesus had done for you on the cross that you found yourself boasting about Jesus, glorying in Jesus, sharing with others what Christ had done for you? And I think the challenge for all of us, because we know how to boast, right? That's not the problem. It's what are we boasting in? And that's the challenge I want to look at this morning. Because why would Paul say in this verse that I boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ? Why boast in the cross? Well, Paul knew, because Paul taught on this a lot, but even the early Christians, they grasped the weight and the depth and the significance of the cross in their faith. They understood it so much that the cross became the symbol for Christianity, right? We've got one right here. Most churches have one or two or three. Many of you wear a cross. The cross has survived some 2,000 years as a symbol for Christianity. But go back to that first century when that cross represented a horrific death. Why would they pick something that most people were scared to even say the word because they knew it was central to the faith. They knew it was critical to them, to, 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 to Christianity. They knew just how important the cross was. And that's why Paul would say, far be it for me to boast in anything except in the cross. And so this morning, I want us to answer that question. Why should I, why should you boast in the cross? And the big idea answers that question. But then we're going to see how that big idea is derived from the passage we're going to look at in Romans chapter 5 in just a minute. But here's the big idea. We boast in the cross. Why? Because of God's amazing love demonstrated through his atoning work on the cross. We boast in the cross because of God's amazing love demonstrated through God's atoning work there on the cross. And so we want to we want to unpack this big idea as we go through Scripture and see why we should be boasting in the cross. Because on the cross, we see, Roman number one, God's amazing love. God's amazing love. Let me, let me read the uh, first few verses in our passage. Romans chapter 5 is where we are, and we're going to begin in verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I'm calling this amazing love, and so I want to be able to prove my point of just how amazing this love that God has for us truly is. And I think the key to it is in verse 8 when he says that in that while we were still sinners while we were still sinners. That's what we were when God showed his love. You see, we often define love, and I say we, I'm thinking culturally, as I love you when you love me, and when you love me, I love you. But we have a hard time when we say, well, I'm gonna love you, but you're not giving me any love back. Or when I love you, and not only are you not giving me any love back, but you're actually fighting against me What's the world going to say at that point? And what are most people going to do? Well, I'm just, I'm out of this. If they're not going to, if they're going to treat me like this, I'm gone. And you see, that's the, that's somewhat of the illustration we see here in the love that God has for us. Because as we're going to see in just a moment that we were, as sinners, totally opposed and rebelling against God. And yet, even in that rebellion, he loved us. Aren't you glad he loved us even in your rebellion? Amen. So let's look, let's unpack this, these, uh, these first few verses. And, and we're going to start with letter A, his unconditional love. His unconditional love. And Paul uses these words here to describe what our condition is outside 
of Jesus Christ. I had someone ask me a couple uh, weeks ago, how come there aren't any uh, blanks anymore on the sermon outlines? You know, we, we've started distributing those. Do y'all remember the blanks we used to have on there? All right, well, there's still no blanks. However, I'm going to give you three phrases that'll go under letter A. If you, and you can pretend, you can draw blanks if you want. Okay, one blank, two blank, three blank. If you, if you just want to get back into the swing of blanks. Not promise anything in the future, but today we're going to let you fill in your own ma- homemade blanks. So here's what we see in our condition before Christ. The first thing is we see that we are weak. We are weak. Verse 6, he says, while we were still weak. And that word probably could better be translated without strength or powerless. And the reason is because when we hear the word weak, we often think, well, I'm, just, I'm feeling a little weak today. I'm not 100%. You know, maybe I'm 90%. The, use the analogy, if you go to the gym, if you normally are grabbing a weight that weighs 100 pounds, yeah, I better back off and only grab an 80-pound weight. You know, today I'm feeling a little weak. That's not the way that Paul is using this word at all. This is, this is power. This is, you go to the gym and you go to grab the weight and you can't even pick up any weight. You probably can barely even grab it. In fact, Paul in Ephesians 2, 1 says that we were dead in our transgressions and our sins. That's, that's how That's how weak and powerless we are when it comes to doing anything on our own to achieve favor with God, to merit God's grace, God's salvation. There's nothing, absolutely nothing. We are weak, powerless, without strength. That's our condition. We are weak. The second thing is we are ungodly. He says in the last part of that verse, he says, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And that word ungodly also has the implication that we are unrighteous, that we are unloving, that we are at odds against God. He'll actually use the word enemy later on down in verse 10. But that's, that's our status outside of Christ, that we are, they are weak and we are ungodly, unrighteous. And so you're seeing this picture build of who we are, that we are weak without power to do anything on our own, that we're ungodly, that we're unrighteous, that we're in rebellion against God. And he doesn't stop there. In verse 8, he says, we are sinners, We are sinners. To sin means to miss the mark, right? That we have missed the mark that God has given us. We missed the mark. But to be a sinner means you're constantly in the stage of missing the mark. Can anybody relate to that? I know I can because I sometimes feel like I'm constantly in that that cycle of missing the mark over and over and over and over. But again, Paul is painting this picture of our condition, of who we are, that we are that we are weak and powerless to save ourselves, that we are ungodly, that we are unrighteous, that we are in rebellion against God, that we are sinners missing the mark over and over and over again. And it's in that state that God demonstrated his love for us. That just blows my mind, that kind of amazing love, undeserving love that God has for us. And truly, I think it's a wonderful exercise for every believer in Christ to spend time recognizing our true condition, our true sinful condition outside of Christ. Because as the more we focus on that, the greater his love. That backdrop paints the picture of God's amazing love. And I'll be honest, I started to really think about that. How could God love a sinner like me? How? How in the world? I know my heart. I know my thoughts. How could God love a sinner like me? And the more I think think about that, the more I meditate on God's amazing grace and mercy to love a sinner like me, the more overwhelmed I, I become. And I would encourage you this season as we prepare to celebrate the resurrection, that we start first at the cross and what God did in demonstrating his amazing unconditional love for a sinner like me and a sinner like you. Kind of the application as I think about that is that as God demonstrated that love for me, I am commanded to love others, right? In fact, we saw this a few weeks ago in John chapter 13. Jesus said, a new command I give you to love one, what? Another. To love one another. And he goes on to say, just as I have loved you, love one another. That was the command that we've been, giving to, been given to love. And we talk a lot about what love means, the definition. Pastor Russell gave it again last week, that love is that unconditional, self-sacrificial commitment to the well-being of another person, right? And you notice the 
unconditional aspect. Just as God has loved me, an undeserving sinner, unconditionally, I am to love my brothers and sisters unconditionally as well. Even when they are unloving, even when it's difficult, even when it's hard, we are called to love one another. But the other side of that, or the second part of that, is we are to do it in a self-sacrificial way, which leads me to letter B, his sacrificial love. Because God, God demonstrated his amazing, unconditional love to me, but he did it through a sacrifice, a sacrifice. There in verse eight, it says, God shows his love for us ultimately by Christ dying for us. That's the sacrificial nature of God's love for sinners. And it's best seen at the cross in what Jesus did for us. Christ died for us. We talk about sacrifice and we talk about it in terms like, you know, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna have to sacrifice uh, you know, an extra hour of, uh, of watching TV so I can spend more time with my, my kids. Or I'm going to have to cut back buying the brand name so I can save a little money and I'm going to buy the generic. And we talk about the sacrifices we make in our time and our, our resources, our money, things that matter the most to us. We talk about these sacrifices. But as I thought about that, even the sacrifices that I think I'm making are big sacrifices. They just so pale in comparison to the sacrifice that God made in sending his son, Jesus Christ, into this world to die on the cross for my sin. That's a sacrifice. That's a costly sacrifice. It cost him his son. That's a rare sacrifice because it cost him his only son. That's an expensive sacrifice because it cost him Jesus' blood shed on the cross for my sin. That's the kind of love, that amazing love that I don't deserve, I'm so undeserving, but yet God demonstrated his love in the most amazing way through a sacrifice of his son on the cross. And we'll talk about what all took place on the cross in just a minute. But I want to make sure we get a grasp, get a, at least begin to think about this amazing love that God has for us that is so undeserving on our, on our behalf. But yet God loves us in that way. He gives a little commentary in verse 7 if we're struggling still with this understanding of sacrifice. He says, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. In other words, it's hard to sacrifice a big sacrifice for a good person, much less somebody that doesn't like us, right? And so once again, he's pointing to the depth of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us. And really, to grasp this kind of love, the unconditional aspect and the sacrifice aspect, starts with recognizing my condition as a sinner. That I was born a sinner, I have committed sin, I am a sinner, and it's in that backdrop that God gave this unconditional, undeserving love in a sacrificial way on the cross for me. We too are to love unconditionally and sacrificially those people around us as well. Again, I'm going to go back to the video because it ties into what we're talking about here. But those four measures, the third one I mentioned was give generously. The fourth one says to love missional, or love sacrificially, to love sacrificially. And that idea that love is sacrifice, that's the definition of agape love that Paul is referring to here. And that's the kind of love that God calls us to love one another sacrificially. And so I think, yeah, it's hard to love someone that doesn't like me, but it, it's even harder to love somebody that I have to give up something precious to me. If I have to give up my time, my energy, my resources to demonstrate that kind of love, that's hard to do. But that's the kind of love we've all been called to live out in our lives. And we'll take a little, a little break here between Roman numeral one and Roman numeral two. Kind of an intermission, but just don't go anywhere. Uh, every week we produce a podcast called Beyond the Notes. How many of you have listened to that podcast? Any, I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, several of you. The purpose of the Beyond the Notes podcast is for whoever preached that Sunday to, to go a little bit further than they were able to with time or they wanted to go a little deeper in a subject. But this week, I'm going to do something quite different. I'm going to focus on helping all of us to prepare for Easter Sunday with resources, uh, things that you, you could use, uh, as well as ideas of things, even if you don't have any resources, things that you can do to prepare your heart for Easter the rest of this week. So I would encourage you to listen, listen in. It, it gets uh, released on Tuesday. You can listen to it anytime you want, but it, it's a podcast where you could 
maybe help you prepare for Easter. I also put on the outline a couple of resources that have been a blessing to me this season. The first one is a devotional book by Paul David Tripp called Journey to the Cross, and it has really blessed me. It's my second time going through it this Easter season. You don't have to do it just during Easter, but it is designed toward, toward Easter, toward the cross and Easter and the resurrection. And the other one is a book that I, I don't know how long it's been out, but I just came across it this, this season about a month and a half ago, and it has really blessed me. It's called The Heart of the Cross, and it's by two authors, Riken and Boyce, and it's just been a blessing to me. And so I just wanted to encourage you with those two resources that might be encouragement to you as well this season. All right, back to our regular scheduled sermon. Roman number two. Roman number two, God's atoning work. So we've seen God's amazing love, and now we're gonna look at God's atoning works. So let's read beginning in verse, verse nine. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So because of God's amazing love demonstrated on the cross, we can now experience his atoning work and salvation on the cross. And we talk about atonement a lot here, but let's make sure we have a, have a good definition, a good working definition of what we mean when we say atoning work or atonement. It's Christ's death on the cross as a substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. It's Christ's death on the cross as a substitutionary sacrifice for our sin. And that's what we mean when we say atonement, that, that Jesus bore the wrath from God's judgment that we deserved, that Jesus paid the penalty for our sins that we could not pay. That's atoning work of Christ on the cross. His death as a substitutionary sacrifice for our sin. And Paul is developing that idea here, and he's going to use two terms. He's going to use two terms. One is justify, and the other is reconcile. And we want to take some time to look at these two terms, because they're very important, because they, they, are, they, are, they deal with what happens when we come to know Christ. And because of the atoning work of Christ on the cross, we are justified and we are reconciled. So let's, let's take a look and see those two words. And, and we need to understand that the word justify, Paul's speaking to the judicial nature of that work, that atoning work. And when we see reconcile, Paul's speaking to the relational aspect or nature of that work of Christ on the cross. So we've got the judicial and the justify and the relational and the, recon, the reconcile. So let's start with letter A, that we are justified. Verse nine says, we have now been justified by his blood. By the way, this is really, really good news for those of us in Christ, that we have been justified by his blood. It means that our standing before a holy God has changed, where we've gone from guilty to not guilty. In fact, the word justify means to declare not guilty, but it also means to declare righteous that we have gone from guilty to not guilty, to unrighteous to righteous by the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That should get the biggest amen ever, amen? That we have, we have, have positional change in Christ from guilty before God to now we have been justified to not guilty. And not only are we not guilty, but we have the righteousness of Christ. It's as if the charges never existed. Those charges of our sin, the penalty of our sin, as if it never existed. And God sees us now, not as unrighteous, but as righteous. That's what he means when he says that we have been justified by his blood. We have been declared not guilty and righteous. Now, notice the means by which we are justified. He says here that we are justified by his blood. He's talking here about the sacrificial, substitutionary, atoning work of Jesus on the cross. That's how we're justified. And by the way, this goes against every fiber in our being because we have a deep desire to do something for ourselves. We think if we're going to have any kind of favor, any kind of merit from God, we have to earn that. In fact, most religions in this world have built their entire system based on what you can do to achieve that. 
what you must follow if you want to have eternal life or heaven or whatever they're promising. Because that's how we're wired. Let's be honest, we all like, if there's a problem, hey, what do I need to do to fix this? That's kind of how we're wired. But this is so different because the work has already been done by Jesus on the cross some 2,000 years ago by the shedding of his blood. Amen? That's what being justified is all about. Solely on the blood of Christ. There's a song that we're going to sing tonight. I say we. I'm, well, maybe I'll sing along. Uh, but a song that's going to be led tonight called No Other Fount. And this song, the words point to the justifying work of Jesus' blood on the cross. I want to read some of the words to you. And this will hopefully encourage you to want to be back here this evening as we have this time of worship together. But listen to these words. Nothing can for sin atone. Hope is found in you alone. Sin and death are overcome only by your precious blood. Only your blood has the power. There is no other, no other fount I know. Jesus, your love made a way. I love it. Your love made a way. No other fount I know can save. Thank you, Jesus, for your shed blood. But wait, there's more, Paul declares when he says in verse 9, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And so it's just thinking about our positional change in Christ should bring the hallelujahs and the praise the Lord's. But he said, wait, there's more. There's more because every sinner is destined to experience God's judgment and wrath. But because of our positional change in Christ, we will be spared God's wrath in judgment in that moment. And God's wrath and judgment, what do we mean when we talk about being spared from the wrath of God? That's what every sinner deserves. We talk about what, is it, what do we deserve as sinners? Hell. That's God's judgment and wrath for every person outside of Christ. And being inside of Christ, that positional change of justification, being justified, declared not guilty, righteous, we will not experience that wrath and judgment from God when that comes. Praise God. Letter B. Not only are we justified, we're also reconciled. We are reconciled to God. And now Paul moves out of the courtroom into the home and into the relationship arena. And to be reconciled simply means to restore a relationship, right? And there's nothing sweeter than having a relationship that's been, that's been broken, that's been, that's been hindered, uh, maybe an estranged relationship. To have it brought back together, that reconciliation, there's something extra precious and sweet and special about the relationship that comes, that's restored like that. And that's how Paul's describing us, that as, as, as sinners, as ungodly and righteous before God, our relationship is broke. It is wrecked. God sees us as a sinner, and we are deserving of his full judgment and wrath. But when we were justified, when we moved from being not guilty, I mean guilty to not guilty, unrighteous to righteous, in that moment, as well as being justified and made right, we also experience this reconciliation with God in that moment. And Paul gets excited about that because listen to what he says. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by life. And he goes on and talks about the reconciliation in verse 11. We'll get to that in just a minute. But what does reconciliation with God look like? What does it mean? I think the simplest way to look at it is peace with God. That we have this restored relationship, this personal relationship with God, and we are at peace because before, as described here, we were at odds against God. We were his enemies. He was our enemy. We were in this battle, in essence. But now it's been restored. There is this peace between us and our creator God, our heavenly father, that can only happen. Listen, that reconciliation, that peace can only happen through being justified the justification by his blood. And that only happens for those in Christ, for those that have recognized their sin condition, realized that they are a sinner, that there's nothing, absolutely nothing they can do to get to God, to get to heaven on their own. And they confess that sin before God. They repent of that sin and place their faith and trust in what Jesus did for them on the cross. That's how we experience justification and reconciliation. So the judge has pronounced us righteous 
And God the Father has welcomed us home. That's what we see in this justifying and reconciling that takes place as Paul describes these two aspects of the atoning work of Christ on the cross. And I'll be honest, when I begin to think, it starts with his amazing love that he initiated all this on, on, for a sinner like me. But then when I begin to think and meditate on what actually happened, what the work that Christ did on the cross, the atoning substitutionary sacrifice that he made so that I could be made right before God, be reconciled before God. That should blow our minds away. It should blow our minds away. Roman numeral three, our response. I love what Paul says here in verse 11. He says, more than that, and he keeps building, much more, more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have now received reconciliation. So what's your response to God's amazing love and his atoning work on the cross? What is, what is your response? Which brings me back to the big idea. And I started that this morning when I was, we were talking about we all have the tendency to boast. But Paul says we should only boast in the cross. And so the big idea says we boast in the cross because of God's amazing love demonstrated through his atoning work on the cross. And you might say, well, where does it say that we're supposed to boast in this passage? I'm glad you asked. Look at verse 11 again. When he says, more than that, we also rejoice. The word that Paul uses here, the Greek word that Paul uses is the exact same word he used in Galatians 6.14 when he says, I boast only in the cross of Christ. It's the exact same word. And it's one of those Greek words that has a depth and breadth of meaning that's hard to, to capture. There's not an English equivalent word that does it justice. And so sometimes it's used in a boast. Sometimes it's used as glory. Sometimes it's used as rejoice, to live in, all of these aspects. And that's what our response should be. That's what Paul says. We should, we should rejoice. We should boast. We should glory in the cross. For those of us in Christ, that should be at the forefront of our minds on a regular basis. And I went, and I asked this question at the very beginning. You know, how much this past week, this past month, have you boast, boasted in Jesus? Have you boasted in the cross? We boast about a lot of things, but our response should be that we should rejoice, that we should boast, that we should glory in what God has done for us through his son, Jesus Christ. And as we enter into the Passion Week, that we have several days until Easter, a week from today, that you have a chance to dwell on this thought of what God has done for you, his amazing love, his sacrificial and unconditional love, and his atoning work, his justifying and reconciling work on the cross that you have a time to let that sink deeply in as you think and dwell and meditate on God's word and what it says about his amazing love and atoning work for you as you prepare your heart for celebrating next Easter. What is your response this morning? If you're sitting here this morning and you think, well, I don't, I don't get it. What do you, you know, what's the big deal about boasting in, in the cross? If you're struggling with understanding why we would get excited about boasting and glorifying Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross, perhaps you fail to really understand your true condition as a sinner. And I think that's a struggle for all of us to understand who we truly are, that I do fall short, that I have no chance to get to God in my own power and in my own strength and in my own abilities, that I have to come to that, rec that realization that I am a sinner and I need a savior. Because apart from anybody being able to save me and I can't do it myself, I'm gonna spend eternity in hell. And it's upon that realization that you began to realize I don't have a chance and hopefully you will look to Christ and see that amazing love and his atoning work for you. And that you will repent of your sins and confess by faith in Jesus and what he has done for you on the cross and allow him to be your savior, not yourself. And for those of us that are in Christ this morning, my prayer for you, and it's my same prayer, that this, this, these next few days will be an opportunity for us to reflect deeply on the cross. Because the deeper we reflect on the cross, I really believe the greater the celebration will be on Resurrection Sunday, right? When we see what he has done for us on the cross, 
We can't wait to get here on Sunday to celebrate with our brothers and sisters in Christ his resurrection power over sin and death. We're going to sing a song in just a minute that I think is a perfect response song for what we have just been talking about. It's entitled, Jesus, Thank You. And there are a lot of things we can thank Jesus for in our lives. But the thing that should be at the forefront of our thoughts as we thank Jesus is what he's done for us on the cross, right? That's what we've been talking about. Listen to the, the chorus of the song we're going to sing in just a minute. Your blood has washed away my sins. We talked about justified by his blood. Your blood has washed away my sins. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, I don't have words to express my gratitude for your amazing love for me. I have a hard time even wrapping my mind about, around all that you've done for me through your son, Jesus Christ. But I do know that I am lost without you, that I was an enemy, unrighteous, sinner, guilty, knowing my own heart, and yet you still love me unconditionally and sacrificially poured out your love at Calvary through the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ, so that I could be found righteous, not guilty, and avoid the wrath and judgment of God. Thank you, Jesus. Help us for these next few moments to reflect on that amazing grace and that amazing mercy that we've experienced for those in Christ through the amazing love and atoning work of Christ on the cross on our behalf. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Church, we stand and respond with us as we thank Jesus for the cross.
Amen. This week, may we ponder the cross as we prepare to celebrate our risen and reigning Savior next Sunday. Don't forget, several opportunities to worship with us tonight at 5 o'clock, night of worship, Thursday night at 6.30, our upper room service. And as you leave, be sure to grab some of those invite cards. Invite your friends, give them all out, come back and get some more. Let's fill this place next week and make much of Jesus together. God bless. Finally, good news. The Easter season speaks of the most hope-filled thing that has ever happened. The good news of Jesus' resurrection is a saving hope that we all need. There's no place like McGregor Baptist Church to celebrate Easter Sunday in worship and Bible study this Easter season. And we can't wait to meet you at one of our in-person services. Our McGregor Church family is here for you and your family. So join us on Sunday, April 17th at one of our worship services at 8, 9.30 or 11 a.m. We hope to see you there.